Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my niece started a fire that damaged my home, and now her parents refuse to pay for the damages. I rent out my house through a service that includes insurance when it's in use. The insurance does not cover when I lend my house out to friends and family since they're not paying me. I have regular homeowner's insurance for that. My brother was using my home with his family just after New Year's. It's a slow time and I wasn't going to lose out on much income. My niece stayed up late one night and didn't go out for breakfast with her family, so she decided to make herself some food. She started a kitchen fire. She freaked out and called 911 instead of using the fire extinguisher in the kitchen. She's 14, so I can't blame her too much. The smoke damage will cost about $8,700 to fix. I told my brother he could take his time paying me back. He said he wasn't going to pay for an innocent mistake. I needed the house in order, so I just fixed everything. I didn't go through insurance because I didn't want my rates going up. I was obviously upset, so I posted about the fire and how upset I was with my brother. Pretty much all of my friends and family took the side of the innocent angel. They said it was unfair of me to expect that much money from him when he could have rented a hotel for a quarter of the price. So I agreed. I said that from now on, my house was off limits unless they rented it out or if I was there and they came over as my guests. Since I only use the house with my family, that means they can rent it or they can only use the empty bedroom. It has a twin bed and a crib. Now the howling started that I'm being unfair to them for something that wasn't their fault. I offered to take up a collection from them to cover the repairs or the increased insurance premiums and most of them shut up. I directed them all to my brother. He got quite angry at me for blaming him for the situation. I said I wasn't about to send a mob after my niece. I bought the house after I got a settlement from a worksite accident. I used the income to supplement the difference and what I used to earn at my old job and what I do now. So I guess my question is, am I the jerk for telling everyone who has a problem with me charging rent or stuffing a family into a room meant for two kids to talk to my brother about it? Not the jerk. Your brother deserves to be the one dealing with the flag. If I were him, I would have at least offered to pay the increased insurance premiums, or that amount monthly until the repairs were paid off, if you didn't go through insurance. He's the one who wrecked it for everyone, and anyone who took his side, I would not trust in my house. Am I the jerk for ruining my flatmate's anniversary weekend and crossing his girlfriend's boundaries? My, 22 female, roommate, 22 male, is my best friend and he has been for years. We've lived together for two and a half years and it's genuinely the best living situation I've ever been in. We love to hang out and we have a very close relationship, often talking for hours on end. Two years ago, he started seeing Rachel, 21 female. Rachel and I get along very well, often drinking together and watching movies without my roommate. I consider her one of my best friends. Rachel is also frequently at my flat, often spending four days there at a time. The problem arose a week before their two-year anniversary. Rachel asked me to leave the flat that my roommate and I share for the weekend because they celebrate their anniversary over two days and she wants to be alone with him. She wants me to sleep in her bed at her flat that she shared with her two other flatmates. I pushed back against this as I have a weekly call on Sunday and the Wi-Fi in her flat is terrible and would make the call quality extremely poor. She agreed to let me stay home on Sunday and says that she'll make her bed for me to sleep in on Saturday. All is well. Then Saturday comes. I'm at the library writing my dissertation with a good friend and I get a text from Rachel telling me that she's sorry but that she forgot to change her sheets for me to sleep in. She asks me to instead go sleep at another friend's house. I say that I don't want to do that as this friend's house is very far away. She gets very upset with me and says it will have to be Sunday instead. I again refuse as this is the day that I have my weekly call. Rachel absolutely blows up at me. She says that I have violated her boundaries and that she can't believe that I've done this to her. She says that I'm acting like her very cruel and mean mother. She berates me for the other time that I came home after she told me to stay at another house and that was another boundary crossed. I'm astounded at this. The reason I went to my house was I was being followed by some guy in the dark. I even sat outside of our door for 30 minutes and was planning on staying there for a few hours to give them their space until she opened the door to let me in. I immediately take it back and say that I'll go to her house for both nights so they can have a special weekend. Since this has happened, she has not spoken to me for four weeks. 
I have repeatedly reached out to her to apologize, but I've gotten literally nothing back. She's come over to my flat a few times in the meantime, but has ignored me when she walks to his room. There was even an occasion where I was hanging out with two of my friends and she ignored me and had a conversation with the two of them in front of me, even arranging for them to hang out later again without me. Though I still feel bad, my friends have told me that I've done nothing wrong and that she's being a jerk. Plus, she has no right in general to order me out of my house. So Reddit, am I the jerk? What does your roommate have to say about this? OP, he's very adverse to conflict. There have been massive friend fallouts that he has sat out of because he doesn't like to pick sides. He just never thought this would bite me in the backside like this. But yeah, he hasn't said anything and I'm not really expecting him to. She's a user, gaslighter, and is taking advantage of you. Talk to your roommate and don't apologize again. OP, I guess I thought that I was breaking a boundary I didn't understand. It's reached the point where my roommate needs to be brought in. I'll talk to him tomorrow and sort this out because I'm really tired of being a stranger in my own home. You're right about me missing a backbone. I thought I was doing something nice and ended up being a pushover. This is an absolute wake-up call. My roommate has said nothing. He's super adverse to conflict and normally it's fine, but this has just gone too far at this point. She probably walks all over him too. OP. Yeah, a thing I didn't mention in the post is that during this four-week period, he and I were hanging out together in our living room she was in his bedroom, and she whistled for him. Yeah, like a dog. So he stood up and went to his bedroom to be with her. She's been treating him poorly, and I really don't like it. Is she jealous of your relationship with him? 1. Nothing that I've noticed. We've been best friends for four years, to the point where people wouldn't refer to us as one person, and we tend to cuddle a lot, which I could see as upsetting her, if not for point two, which is, I only date other women. I love him a lot, but it's purely platonic. Even when we met, there was never a hint of anything. Update. Well, good news and bad news. Me and Rachel are no longer friends, and her and my best friend are over. When I sat down with my flatmate to finally talk about how hurt I'd been feeling about the whole situation, he listened to my feelings and he was supportive of me, placing down boundaries about our home. He apologized for not calling her out, saying he had no clue how to get between me and her. Then he left and told me he was going to talk to her about everything and get it sorted, which I really appreciated. Communication really is key, I guess. Cue to me waiting about four hours. I figured they must have been talking for a while, but I won't lie, around hour three, I started to get worried. When he came back, he was incredibly despondent and upset. When he went over to talk to me, she had broken up with him. The second he brought up how upset she had made me, she told him that their relationship was over. Apparently, Rachel had been feeling for a while that they had a highly codependent relationship and needed a while to figure out how she can be on her own. She also said that every time she wasn't with him, she started having severe anxiety, even on the level of panic attacks, which is why she hated me being there when they were on dates and why she didn't like me spending time with them. He was deeply shocked and asked her why. She responded, She gets to see you 24-7 and I only get a few hours. She's being selfish with your time and mine. Whoever asked if she was jealous was right on the money. She also revealed that she had hated me since we met, labeling me as not a person she would ever hang out with and hid that from me and my best friend for years. She said that this is a break and that she still loves him and wants to get back together with him, just later. Personally, I don't see that happening. My best friend is heartbroken and deeply hurt by how she approached their relationship and me. When I asked if he thought this was a break, he responded, No way. She came back over the same day to pick up some stuff from our flat. Just as I was about to close the door on her, I said, I think it's obvious to both of us that we're not friends and probably never were. She just shrugged. I'm sorry, but anniversary or no, no one tells me I can't come back to my own home that I'm paying for. OP's roommate dodged a howitzer there. Good riddance. Am I the jerk for telling my wife that I would choose my mom over the birth of our baby? So to get started, I'm 36 male and my wife is 33 female. We're expecting our first baby soon. My mother, who is 70, was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer and has been hospitalized since it's so bad, doctors say that she won't survive since treatments aren't working well for her. My dad passed when I was young and my mom took care of me while working two jobs so that I could have a good life. I feel I owe everything to my mother. 
I bought her a house and whatever she needed so that she could live her older years well since we had to struggle so much. When I got home from work and visiting my mom, my wife and I were talking and she asked if you got a call that I was in labor or your mom was going to pass, who would you pick? I told her I would pick my mom. She asked why and I told her that I wanted to be there to say goodbye to my mom since I would never get to see her again and so she would have somebody there in her final moments. She got mad and said, what about her and our baby? I told her I would try to be there as fast as I could after my mom, but that most likely that wouldn't happen, so I told her not to worry about it. She was still mad and told me to get out of the house. I left and now I'm staying at my mom's house. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit, to everyone saying that I would be leaving her alone. No, I wouldn't. She would have her mom there since she has said she wanted her mom to be there with her. Yes, I was right for leaving my house. It was either I leave or she go, and I was not about to put my pregnant wife out of the house. Yes, I have been there for her. I have taken off of work to comfort and help her in any way she needs during this pregnancy. Edit 2. I keep getting the same question about why did I leave my house even though I may own the house. It was late, and I didn't want my pregnant wife out late at night, but she told me to leave, so I knew it was either me or her. 2. My mother is in the hospital. She's not at her house. 3. I thought a lot about what a lot of you said about how I should put her first, but she doesn't put me first at all. She chooses her sisters over me all the time. 4. I do not make her feel second. I've put my wife first, especially in emergencies, and I've tried my best to comfort her. I've gone home, and now I'm thinking I don't need to apologize. What do you think? I just don't know. You got kicked out of your house for getting a hypothetical question wrong. On face value, you're not the jerk, but what's likely happening is that your wife isn't feeling the support and love she really wants and needs right now. Is she a super needy, controlling person or simply feeling a tad neglected, hormonal? I think you need to consider the why she asked the question and address that. That's the problem. The hypothetical question and hurt reaction is simply how it plays out. Get out of your mom's house and go fix this. Leaving her home alone isn't going to help. Sleep out in front if you need to. Bring lots of apologies too. You were not kicked out for a bad answer here. There's a feeling of loss and something missing that your wife isn't feeling and needs to as soon as possible. Figure that out and go give it to her. You give her another version of it every day for the rest of your life. Go find... <laughs> How do you people come up with this stuff? Go find out what part of love your wife doesn't think she has. Don't become a you're the jerk and sleep at your mom's house. OP. No, she's not a needy, controlling woman. I never thought about that, but I did plan to go home and apologize today and ask her some questions about it. Have you missed important appointments or not helping out around your own house as much? Making your wife feel like she's alone for her to ask questions like that? OP. No, I've been to all but one and that's because she forgot to tell me about it. When I come home, I wash the dishes from dinner and clean the floor. Usually she prefers to cook. I have taken off a lot of days to help and comfort her through this, so maybe I could do more. I don't know what else to do, but I will ask though. It's a hard choice, but I'd still say not the jerk, as long as your wife does actually have another plan for getting to the hospital and someone to support her. If not, the situation is a little iffy. Chances of both happening at the same time are quite unlikely though, so here's hoping you don't actually have to choose. OP. Yes, she does have support. Her mom and sisters live close to us, about five minutes away, they would be able to drive her. Update. I went back home yesterday afternoon. She wasn't there. I assumed she was at her mom's house. She came back in the evening and we had to talk about what happened. She did apologize for asking the question and that when she thought about it, she understood my answer because she would do the same. I asked her why she asked. She said she didn't know and thought I was going to pick her since I normally do. I kind of just said okay and moved on. I did tell her I want marriage counseling after or even before the baby is born. She asked why. I told her how I felt and she denied it, so I had to give her proof. Then she started crying and got mad and told me to sleep in the guest room instead of kicking me out, so I guess I got a win there. You call that a win? Anyways, she also told me that she no longer wanted me in the delivery, which I was fine with. I understand to an extent where it's coming from. I will go into therapy, which was suggested, and I think I do need it. Anyways, that's it. Thanks for the advice y'all gave, some good and some bad. And sorry if my comments came off as mean. I'm not really a friendly person till you know me, especially if you're accusing me of something.
You would be fine with not being there to see the birth of your baby? Really? OP. No, but it's her choice. I can't make her let me in there. You could have told her it's a priority for you, that you're sorry too, that you guys were talking hypothetical, and that the chances of your mom passing on your kid's birthday are very slim. You could have tried to make her see that it's important to you. Just accepting it would make me feel like you just don't care. Also, you could have been more understanding, taken accountability, and apologized to her before you brought in marriage counseling. OP, I did tell her that she is a priority, and she did see it's important to me, because she would do the same. And we did all that. Why do all y'all want me to argue with a pregnant woman? Please tell me you're in therapy. Please. OP, I have made an appointment with one. Update 2. I read a lot of your comments, and I did apologize, not for bringing up marriage counseling, but for the timing I brought it up, and that I did show her proof. She did forgive me and told me that I was still not going to be at the birth of our baby. I said to her that it was okay and that I had accepted it and I wasn't going to fight her on her choice. I did tell her that I think she and I both need some space before the baby comes, to which she agreed. I told her I would leave and that she could have the house and that if she needed anything to just call or text me. No, I'm not at my mother's house. I'm at a friend's house. He doesn't live there anymore, but he usually rents it out. To all of you asking, why don't you kick her out? It's because I'm the only person who makes money in the house, and I know especially now that if I kick her out, it will be called financial, emotional manipulation, or even mistreatment. So it's better a lot of times if I leave. Yes, I do plan to go back home when the baby is born, and to someone who asked, I do plan to take paternity leave. No, she does not know where I'm at. She didn't ask, so I didn't tell, mainly because her family would be banging on my door. To people who I know are going to ask, why aren't you fighting harder to be in the delivery room? I've learned that some things I cannot control, and one thing is, if she doesn't want me in there, then I won't be. Lastly, to people who are saying they need more details, I'm not used to just randomly talking about myself. It's been that way since I was a kid. I've gotten better since I was a kid, but it's still a struggle. So if you have a question, give me a specific question because I'll answer. And about the divorce thing, I do care if she divorces me. I do love her, but I can't control how she feels. So personally, I won't beg her not to. I will suggest that we get help, but if she doesn't want to, then that's fine. I'm secure. What I mean by that is she will get nothing in the divorce. Does she know that? I don't know. Final update. I have good and bad news. So I will start with the good news. My wife had the baby on January 26th. It's a girl and I love her so much. I wanted to name her after my mother, but we found a compromise and her middle name is my mother's name. To the questions I'm going to get about was I in the delivery room, I was not. I did ask, but I got a no. And she said she had already told her sister and that she couldn't hurt my feelings. Which, okay, by then I had stopped caring. The bad news is my mother passed. She passed a week before my baby was born. A decent bit of her friends came to the funeral, and if you go back up a sentence, I said I had stopped caring a lot, she didn't come to the funeral. She made stupid excuses, and I just said forget it. It was nice though. I'm mad that she wasn't there when I needed her, so I haven't been talking to her as much, so I won't yell at her. We talk about the baby and her, and other than that, we don't talk. I'll bring up marriage counseling in a few weeks from now, but for now, I'm just going to focus on my baby. Both of these people suck but he might suck a bit more. You don't play around with hypothetical questions like that because that's crappy. Everything he did was crappy too. What did he do? Go to his dying mother? What a jerk. Leave the house when she demanded him to instead of forcing his presence there? What a meanie. Suggesting marriage counseling and getting banned from the delivery room for his efforts? Someone call the police. How was he acting crappy? She's the one with the princess syndrome and lack of empathy who was playing sight games and using their baby's birth as a tool for punishment and revenge. The part that makes me the most upset about these stories is how some people let others push them around. Like even if you're married to somebody and even if they're pregnant, you just, you can't allow people to treat you like this. Am I the jerk for talking about my perfect pregnancy and making my sister feel bad? I'm 24 female. My sister, who's 29, has an 18 month old baby girl. Her pregnancy was very rough. She was very sick. Her husband and her separated in the middle of the pregnancy and she didn't have a lot of support from our parents, which isn't their fault. They were low contact before she got pregnant because of some stuff my sister and her husband had done. Lately, they've gotten back in touch again and they're fixing their relationship. 
I'm 35 weeks pregnant as well, and my pregnancy wasn't entirely hard. My husband and I have a good relationship, even better now, I'd say. My relationship with my parents and our siblings has always been good too, and besides some minor inconveniences, my pregnancy has been great so far. My mother is planning to move in with us for one or two weeks, we'll see, after I give birth to help me out, which is something she didn't do for my sister. We were discussing this last Saturday because our parents had a family dinner and both of us were invited. Our parents and our sister-in-law, brother's wife, were asking me about my pregnancy as well and if we were preparing for the baby. I don't feel like we were only talking about me and my baby, like we were all having normal conversations about work, politics, football, stuff we regularly talk about. However, when I was telling them about my last checkup, my sister told me that it's not right to brag. I asked her what she meant because I wasn't bragging at all. She told me that talking about how good and perfect my pregnancy has been so far is bragging. Once again, I told her I'm not bragging. My mom backed me up on that. Well, as soon as our mother spoke, my sister blew up. She accused me of being mean, of being a golden child, of wanting to drag the attention back to me, of being overbearing, etc. She said that I'm enjoying that she and her daughter are second-class citizens to our family because she's sure that everyone will spoil my baby as they spoil me. That I'm faking weakness to gain sympathy and have everyone pampering me. I told her to not blame me for her mistakes because if she didn't have a great support system, it's because of her own fault and not mine. She called me a selfish and spoiled brat and I called her a bitter and envious jerk. She also had a fight with our parents and my husband. Lastly, our dad told her to leave. My husband and I stayed a bit longer and we were all talking badly about her, I admit that. Now that I'm thinking about it, I wonder if I made a mistake. Our whole family is rethinking if they want to go low contact with her again, so I don't know. I'm just doubting myself. Edit. The problem our family had with her is regarding some inherited jewelry from our grandmother. She pawned them to go on an expensive vacation with her husband. She got some of it back, but lost a necklace that had been in our family for generations. We all love our grandmother and really valued these things since they were important to her. And she never acknowledged her mistake or apologized, which is the worst of this. Because if she had at least apologized and said that she was very sure that she'll be able to get the items back, then it would have been different, I think. She knows she hurt us, but never even apologized for hurting our feelings and our grandma's memory. And all of this happened before she got pregnant. This was just the last straw for our families to go low contact since my sister and her husband constantly disrespected our family's feelings over and over again. Edit 2. I don't understand why everyone seems to be judging one thing about the necklace when we were already fixing that. I didn't ask for judgment because of that issue. It's because of this other issue during dinner. One of our brothers is no contact with her and her ex since they refused to pay for the car that he sold them. They had agreed on a price, but then they stopped paying. As for the comments, it was all kinds of things that were meant to hurt, there's also the petty things like complaining about food when they came over for dinner, not helping pay for a big dinner when we all agreed to it and the rest of us had to cover their part as well. Not the jerk. Redditors are obsessed with the idea that kids can do no wrong and parents are always at fault. If your sister really pawned the family jewelry for an expensive vacation, then she can't expect to receive all love from the family. And no way you guys are defending the heirloom sale like you guys are privileged if you view heirlooms as indispensable. Everyone sucks here. She's definitely taking her anger out on you, but man, your family sounds lovely. You can be upset with her, but man, you can't expect to rebuild a relationship with her when you guys literally talked crap for a long period after she left. I may not get along with my sister all the time, but I don't talk crap about her the second she leaves. Makes me wonder if she's correct about you being the golden child. Did she get treated less than when you were growing up? And P.S. You may be upset that she sold family heirlooms, but they were hers to sell. She didn't steal them. It sucks and I get it, but I wouldn't destroy a family over heirlooms. Karen takes my credit card and gets upset when caught. Backstory. My husband and I have now been married for almost 18 years. My mother-in-law is the most entitled, choosing beggar I've ever known. I have many stories, so if y'all like this one, I will add more. First time posting, be nice please cast. We've got me, we've got hubby, and we've got mother-in-law. When my now husband and I were engaged, we had one credit card that we used for emergencies or small things. We were buying a house, getting married, so he paid it off so we would have it if needed for house. All good. Nope. 
statement for the card came in and showed thousands of dollars in purchases, including Disney World tickets for three, with all of the accoutrements, stereo system, clothes, computer and desk, several semesters of college for one of his younger brothers, and more. Hubby was mad, called credit card company, and they stated it was on his second card. He tried to explain he did not have a second card. That is when they revealed that he had signed for a second card on his application. Hint, he didn't. Apparently, entitled parents saw him put application in mailbox. He lived on grandparents' farm that had main house and a few trailers for family to live in. Once he left, she opened it and marked for a second card for herself and put it back in. So, prior to our engagement, Hubby was paying almost all of entitled parents' expenses as he was the oldest of five and felt responsible for them. Dad divorced and stepdad left. Once we became engaged, and especially once I became pregnant, he told entitled parent he couldn't anymore as he had his own family to take care of now. Entitled parent did not take this well. She took that second card and took two siblings to Disney World and everything else listed above. Hubby stormed into Entitled Parent's kitchen and demanded the card. Some is paraphrased as this happened a while ago, but this is mostly how it went down. Hubby, give me the credit card, now! Entitled Parent, what card are you talking about? Fake, confused expression. Hubby, the one you signed for yourself and just spent thousands on. Entitled Parent, oh, I was gonna wait until your birthday and give it to you as a present. And well, now you ruined it. She wanted more time to go shopping. I'll bet. Give it. Now. But now. Entitled parent hands over credit card grudgingly, and Hubby promptly cuts it up, making her very upset. He tells her that was supposed to help us through with the house, wedding, and pregnancy. We decided to go for the trifecta, and now we were thousands in debt, and she needed to pay us back. I don't have that kind of money. I'm your mother, and you needed to help me. Hubby, I have. I have my own family now. We are your family. Payment, now. So Entitled Parent called in his youngest sister and youngest brother, who was developmentally delayed, to write Hubby a check for $100 from each of their accounts to pay for their trip to Disney World, and gave us another $100 in loose pennies. We never got another dime. Had to wrap pennies every day for a week to return them before change machines were available and the bank only took wrapped, signaled, and dated. Fast forward three years. She comes over to our tiny two-bedroom apartment and tells hubby, What happened? You used to be so good with money. I had to get in front of him and told her to leave before she got hurt. Never saw him so angry in my life. So... That is how we ended up with $10,000 in credit card fees, including late fees. He wouldn't press charges because it was his mom. I have so many more stories too. Next we've got, fire me, you're all losing your jobs. After uni, late 2018, I fell on rough times and was forced to move back to my hometown. I tried to transfer my job to a branch in my area, but failed. Thus, I needed to get a new job. I settled for a 20 hour a week job at a bookies with a second bartending job in the evenings. The bookies is the target for my revenge, which was entirely accidental. Involved are the following. Janelle, my manager's manager. Shay, my manager. George and Gordon, my coworkers. And Kara, a coworker at another store who is relevant later. Names changed and or redacted. I ended up working behind the counter as a customer service manager Basically a step up from a cashier. It's fancy when seen on a CV, but there's nothing really to it. I took bets, chatted with customers, helped people with machines, and for the vast majority of my shift, sat around waiting for something to do. I got on well with my coworkers, or so I thought, and had no major issues. It was 20 hours a week, about one pound more than a minimum wage job with a lot of overtime required of me and irregular shift patterns. Though I had no issue with the job, beyond how difficult it was to juggle the schedules of both of my jobs. In February of 2019, after working for the company for six months, I was invited to a probation hearing. It cannot be emphasized enough that it was a probation hearing, 
in which I would have my performance reviewed and, as informed in training, was entitled to a pay raise at the end of it. I arrived that morning to a disciplinary hearing where, without even a shred of evidence, I was accused of 11 different cash discrepancies dating back to early November of 2018, shortly after I had started, which all amounted to 271 pounds, all but one of which I had never heard of before. These had apparently been reported and logged by my manager, Shay, and my coworkers, despite no one saying a word to me at all. Not a whisper in the five months this had apparently been occurring. I was told that it was unacceptable. A call was made to HR and I was terminated on the spot and forced to hand over my keys and to never set foot in the store again. To my protests, I was told the decision could not be appealed and I would eventually receive written confirmation of my employment's termination in the post. I didn't let myself slump around and feel sorry for myself, so on the way home, I opened up Indeed and applied for a bunch of jobs and, before I arrived home, had an interview set up for the next week at what is my current place of work. Now I was furious, fuming at having gone to what I thought should have been a normal probation meeting and having, effectively, been called a thief and been banned for life from a place I'd never go to anyway. But somehow, my parents were angrier and ordered me to let them know when they got into contact with me again. Almost two weeks later, I received an email from the company's HR which reiterated the accusations and stated again that I was terminated. My mom sat me down in the kitchen and walked me through a letter response that was two parts professional and three parts scathing. Ripping into them about their unprofessional conduct, their ludicrous claims, their lack of evidence, the holes in their story, because there were quite a few, and finally, the cherry on the cake, the employment laws they had broken. Now I didn't want much, just a nice reference, a promise that not a whisper of these accusations would turn up when my new job asked them for a reference, because by then, I'd already been offered the job. I then attached the letter to an email to fire back at their HR department, then I added Janelle's work email, then her boss's email and finally the holding company that owned the brand, cause I wanted to make sure this was seen. A bit of background, the bookies I worked for is a brand that is owned by an international company. Their name, behind the scenes, is slapped on everything and they pretty much dictate everything we did. I'm not sure if holding company is the correct term, but I'll stick to that for now. Anyway, I sent this email with a 48 hour window for a response. I received a reply the next day from the same email that my demands were being met. I smirked victoriously and moved on with my life, happy to wash my hands with the entire ordeal. However, I'd set off a chain reaction that I wouldn't know about until three months later. Three months on, I'd settled into my new job, a call center position with double the hours and well over double the pay. I'd gone through training and was settling into my new position when I see a new set of trainees settling in near my team. Among them was Gordon, one of my coworkers from the bookies. I was stunned. Gordon had been at the bookies for six years when I joined. He was well liked, good at his job, and a favorite of the managers. There was no way he'd been fired. Though I didn't really want to talk to him, as I was of the impression that he, George, and my manager had likely set me up, I did want to know what happened. Luckily, on seeing me in the break room one shift, he sought me out and told me everything. Apparently, my email had been read by the higher ups in the holding company and had caused a lot of scrutiny to fall onto the bookies in our town, of which there were three in our area that Janelle was responsible for, two in my town and a third in a neighboring one. Someone in HR passed a message down to the area manager, Janelle's boss, claiming they wanted things investigated and they wanted results yesterday, causing him to drop everything and descend on our little town with the panic and aggression of a man whose superiors were watching his every breath. He went to Janelle wanting to know why he hadn't been made aware previously that I was apparently stealing money, why I had been given keys to the shop and shifts on my own when allegations of that nature were attributed to me and why I hadn't been put under investigation. Turns out, Janelle had, in fact, put in my employee file that I was under investigation but had never actually gone through with any of the official procedures for monitoring and investigating me. 
Thus, she had fired me for the accused crime without looking into it at all, falsely claiming otherwise. Thus, the area manager took the dates and amounts of the cash discrepancies, confirmed that they had been reported on those days without my knowledge in Shay's own logbook of the shop's cash and sent that information onto our security team to investigate. Another little detail is that the CCTV for every shop in the brand is outsourced to a private security company who monitors each shop remotely and has access to all the cameras and video. As was procedure, they looked into the dates mentioned to see if I'd been doing anything. I know I wasn't and nothing was ever said to me, but they did find something. Turns out money was going missing from the shop, but surprise, surprise, it wasn't me but George and Shay. They not only set me up, for reasons I will never know, but were also falsifying numbers and cash checks on the system to hide it. One thing Shay was caught doing was deliberately shortchanging customers by taking portions of their winnings without them even knowing it. Bear in mind, a lot of our customers were elderly men and women. Gordon claims that he once opened the shop after I and Shay had closed the night before and noticed a cash difference but had been told not to say anything to me as I was under investigation and it could compromise it. He did apologize and I let it go. Needless to say, George and Shay were fired. But it doesn't end there. Our team was small. Including me, there were a total of four people working at the store. As they hadn't been able to hire anyone to replace me, George and Shay's termination meant Gordon was the only employee at the busiest shop in our area. Even if they'd been able to get other colleagues from the other two shops to help out, it wouldn't have been enough to keep the shop open and manage the amount of customers, so they closed the location down until they could get the staff to run it. It was at that point that Gordon handed in his resignation and applied for his job at my work, meaning they had no one. On top of that, Gordon's girlfriend worked in the same shop as Janelle and she relayed that she was rarely at their store in the other town. For the next few weeks, before the area manager reported she was fired as well. No reason given to her. I was later issued an apology for everything by the area manager and informed she, Janelle, was no longer with the company in an email sometime later. But somehow, it doesn't end there. With the store I worked at closed, this one being on the high street and where most people preferred to go, the other location in town was the much smaller location in the suburbs, the one where Kara worked alone. She suddenly received an influx of customers into her tiny store space and absolutely no support from other staff or upper management. Thus, for her own mental health, having already been overworked and underpaid, running an entire store by herself, she quit, meaning that location had to be closed down too. All of this at the worst possible time, March, when the Cheltenham Festival was occurring, which is a huge moneymaker in that industry even in a small town like ours. An opportunity the three other bookies on the high street reaped the benefits of instead of my old place, as the former customers went to them instead. As it currently stands, just over a year later, both shops remain closed and I'm currently entering a job in cybersecurity, the training for which I paid for with my current job. Thank you for firing me, jerks. You did me a favor. Next we've got Customer doesn't understand how receipt lookups work. I work behind the return desk at a decently large retail store. I deal with every type of customer imaginable, the kind ones, the rude ones, and the especially rude ones. It was two to three weeks ago when one of these especially rude customers rolled in with a return. Multiple returns, rather. Right off the bat, I knew I was in for a treat. I was in the process of reticketing items previously returned on my desk leaving little to no space for any more items on said desk. That's when this customer comes and slams her bag of returns right on top of everything I was working on, including our expensive machines. Machines remained okay, by the way. No greeting said, just returns. I muster up the tightest smile possible and slowly remove my own work elsewhere and begin opening a computer for the return. I then ask the basics, do you have a receipt? Nope. What about the form of payment used to purchase these items? Nope. I then tell her that I'll begin a receipt lookup in hopes of finding proof of these purchases so she can receive the full amount back for them. I start asking for her phone number in hopes that it's linked to our reward system, which would make the search easier. 
This is where she loses her patience. Just as I'm about to ask when these items were purchased, she goes off. Why don't you just scan the items? Scanning them should bring up my receipt. I tell her, no, that's not how purchases from our store work. She rolls her eyes at me and laughs. And you just don't want to do it. Every other store does it for me. Stop making this difficult. I explain as calmly as possible that it's not possible to pull up a receipt just from scanning a barcode from the items bought. We need a specified date when bought and either a phone number, email, or form of payment used in said purchase tagged along with an item ID. Not just the item ID alone, that's literally useless. She gives me attitude for another few minutes as I go back months and months in an attempt to find her receipt to these items. But alas, she had to make yet another comment about my work. This shouldn't be as difficult as you're making it out to be. She angrily stated as she tried tilting the computer monitor so she could get a look at what I was doing from behind the desk. Not allowed. I quickly stopped her movements, wanting to protect our property, and snapped. It becomes difficult when you come in here empty-handed and impatient. She didn't say much after that. Five more minutes of desperately searching, she gave up. She grabbed her unreturned items and thanked me for nothing. I smiled and told her to have a great rest of her day, to which she replied, Forget you, to me and left. A coworker was quick to fill me in on previous encounters she had with that same customer. Apparently, she's known for being the worst of the worst, thrives off of it even. Today, Sunday, God's Day, this devil of a woman returned, with more returns. My coworkers and I were already pretty busy as is, but I made it a priority to take care of this red-horned woman despite it. I make room on our desk for her and beckon her up. She has attitude right off the bat. I'm here to return items, and hopefully this time you'll actually return them instead of BSing me like my last visit. I grinned and told her I remembered her and hoped she was doing well. She ignored it and beckoned to her items. I searched the bag she provided for a receipt, and what do you know, she didn't have one. Nor did she have the form of payment used to purchase them with. Q deja vu. Despite the previous interaction, she still couldn't handle the questions I had next. Dates, emails, phone number, anything to help, she still didn't get it. Still didn't appreciate my efforts to find her receipt. I never have issues with this stuff, not from any other stores. This specific store is beyond terrible with its customer service. You should be ashamed with how you've treated me. To her lack of knowledge, a manager had been watching the interaction from the start as she was familiar with the customer herself. My manager swooped in after that statement, sweetened the customer up a bit, and somehow got a brand new phone number out of her, one that this customer never provided me with, and which helped me find the receipt just like that. Her items matched with the receipt found, and she was credited a whopping $195 to her card. You would think she would be happy that the issue was solved, but unfortunately, no. She began asking my manager why our systems were so flawed and why it takes so many steps for a receipt to be found. My manager explained our policies regarding the subject and the devil woman left without another word spoken. I never even get rude with customers like I got with this woman, even ones that talk to me with serious attitude. This one crossed a ridiculous amount of lines. From nearly ruining our printing machines, touching our property without permission, showing impatience, and being overall rude to me, despite my long efforts to retrieve her receipt, I felt defeated. Returns without any proof of a purchase are hard, beyond hard sometimes, but we like to go the extra mile in an attempt to find them for customers. Nobody wants to go home without their money back. We know this. We try to help. We really do. I wish more people could sense this. Older lady I always help in the grocery store thought I worked there. I do my shopping the exact same time every week in a large grocery store. There's a little old woman who usually does her shopping at around the same time. She has some mobility issues and doesn't buy much. So after a few times of seeing her having to flag down help every time she wanted something from a shelf above the shoulder level, I approached her and asked if she'd like a shopping companion. It took me under 10 minutes to get everything on her list and she was very gracious and grateful, even offered me a few dollars, which I didn't accept, of course. I didn't give this a second thought. I wasn't raised to question whether you take 10 minutes to help an old woman in her grocery store or not. It's just what you do. So next week, when I saw her again, 
I asked if she'd like someone to shop with her, and she was again very grateful for the help. It became our usual routine that whenever I spotted her, usually every other week or two, I'd give her a hand. One week, I didn't do my shopping at the usual time. I worked a little late, and when I came in, there was a big fuss at the customer service desk involving my shopping friend and a young man. I started to go over to be sure everything was all right and hear the young man say, What do you mean no one with that name works here? She had a name tag on. My mom saw the name, right ma? And she said she did. And the customer service kid is saying he really doesn't have anyone by that name who works there. The young man is going, What do you mean? Did you fire her? She was here last week, right ma? And I realize it's my name and the potential source of confusion. I go in for shopping immediately after work and my work uniform is a maroon shirt and the khaki pants with a name tag. The grocery store I shop at has white shirts, any kind of pants you want, and a maroon apron with the store's logo, so a little similar. I go over and she gleefully cries, there you are, I want you to meet my son. And he started telling me how grateful he is I was taking time out of my work to personally help his mom shop and now that he's in town, he wanted to say thanks in person and give me some money or at least put in a good word with my manager at the store. So could I point them out so he could speak with them? I explained the confusion and they were both so touched. It was one of the most poignant moments of my life and definitely the most meaningful I've ever had in a supermarket. If you saw a little old lady trying to reach something in a supermarket but you could reach it, would you help her? Please let me know. Entitled mom yells at me for bad service and then asks me for a job. So I'm the manager of a popular fast food chain and our store is crazy when it comes to service because of the demands of the owner. You get better service in our dingy little burger joint than any five-star restaurant. We rush to open the door for our customers as they enter and leave. We serve them at their table, clear away their dishes, and we bring mints at the end of their meal. I'd also like to point out that we are not allowed to take tips, and if customers do leave tips, it goes to the owners. Also, we always go to the table after the customer has had a few bites to make sure everything is to their satisfaction. Anyways, this entitled mom was dining in and apparently she is a regular, though I've never seen her before. She comes up to me in the middle of a huge rush. Entitled mom. Excuse me? Me. Hello, how can I help you? Entitled mom. Your employee was really rude. I want her fired. May I ask what she did to upset you? I told her my son's order tasted disgusting, and she refuses to eat it. Your employee refused to get me a new one. She hands me the receipt, which had about $50 worth of food on it, and that is a lot of food for a fast food place. Me. I'm sorry about that. I'll send someone over to pick up whatever your son didn't eat, and we'll get your order made. What do you mean? We can dispose of the food that he didn't like, so you don't have to clean it yourself. We already ate the food. You ate the food? Yes. You said it was disgusting. It was the worst food I've ever had in my life. Ma'am, I can't remake your entire order again. You've eaten everything. If your son didn't like it, I can definitely remake his order. But it was gross. At this point, her server overhears and joins in the conversation. Server. Ma'am, I asked you if everything was to your satisfaction a couple of minutes after we gave you the order and you responded, everything is fine. Well, it wasn't. Just give me the whole order. Me, I'm sorry ma'am, but I cannot do that. She went nuts. I can't believe this is happening. I've never been treated with such disrespect. My son deserves to eat with his family. He will feel self-conscious if everyone is watching him. Me. Ma'am, I'm only able to fix what was wrong with the order, which is your son's food. The service here used to be amazing. It took us three years to beat you guys to the door. I told all of my church friends how good you guys were. Now you want to embarrass me? Me. I'm sorry you were not satisfied with the service today. She cuts me off. I'm going to tell all of my church friends about you and your scam. We are going to get you fired. She proceeds to storm out without her children, who are scurrying around after her once they realized she wasn't coming back. I brushed this off and sent my report into the owners in case they called corporate. One week later, I'm working the same shift and in walks entitled mom with her kids. She comes up to me and smiles. 
Hi, I'm wondering if you are hiring here. Me, obviously stunned. What? I'm looking for a job, and I absolutely love the service here. I want to apply. Me, what? You want to work here? Yes, your service is amazing. It took us three years to beat you guys to the door. That's how good you guys are. I always recommend my church friends here. I really want to be part of this team. At this point, I am at a loss for words. I put on the sweetest smile and said, Lady, I can assure you that I will never hire you. And I will make sure that none of our other locations will hire you. You are the last person I want on my team, so I will not be accepting your application. I don't think anyone has ever spoken to her like that before, because she just stood there with her jaw flapping open and shut, trying to process what happened. To be honest, I wasn't even sure what happened. I had never spoken to a customer like that before, and it was very thrilling. Since she didn't say anything, I continued, You are more than welcome to tell your church friends what I said. And I walked to the door and held it open for her. She was silent as she walked out and didn't even acknowledge me when I wished her a lovely day. Edit. I just want to add that I live in Canada. Edit 2. Since so many of you are asking for clarification, she said, beat you to the door, because our staff always opens the door for the customers. It took three years for her to open the door for herself. Speaking of fast food, what's your favorite fast food place? Please let me know. I prefer McDonald's. Next we've got Encounter with Entitled Parents in the Pediatric Emergency Room. This happened yesterday. My three-year-old daughter de-exed with pneumonia and we ended up in the emergency room. Pneumonia is very serious. She was put on a nebulizer and O2 and given an IV for more meds while we waited for a room to open up in the PICU. The emergency room was pretty full. The rooms are small and you share them. There is a curtain that divides them. There are no doors, just another curtain. Around 4 p.m., a family arrives with mom, dad, and five-year-old kid. The mom briefly looks in on my side of the room and could see my kid hooked to the machines with an IV. It's obvious that this isn't a stubbed toe. So I can't help but hear the parents explaining why their kid's in the ED. Stomach pain. Meanwhile, the kid is asking for something to eat. She sounds quite perky. Parents insist she has a kidney infection. Whatever. I don't know her history. Not interested. So my daughter was given a shot to help her open her airways. Her O2, which they wanted 90 or above, kept dipping down into the low 80s, making an alarm sound. The nebulizer makes some noise and the side effect is hyperactivity, so my extremely sick kid was medically wired as heck. Within 30 minutes of arriving, the entitled parents call for a nurse and ask for a private room because their kid needs to rest somewhere quiet. Meanwhile, their kid was blasting YouTube videos from her tablet and loudly demanding chocolate chip cookies and milk. The nurse explains that there are no private rooms in the emergency room. My daughter then starts having a coughing fit, which is scary as her O2 drops off and she chokes. I had two nurses in there trying to help by suctioning her and patting her back. I'm trying to help her. My daughter's turning blue. I hear the entitled mother ask the nurse, how long are we going to be expected to listen to that? Afterwards, my daughter was wiped out and was crying a little, and the entitled mom rang for her nurse again and asked again for someplace quiet so her girl can rest. Her daughter was making a lot of noise playing with something. Then they started playing with the lights. The room has a switch to control the lights on each side and then a master switch to cut all the lights. My daughter's afraid of the dark. The entitled dad cuts the lights for the room, making it quite dark with the curtain over the door way drawn. I tell my husband to turn on the lights on our side, which he does. The entitled mom calls her nurse to complain that it's too bright for her girl to sleep. It's 5 p.m. The nurse explained that they are welcome to shut the lights off on their side, but they have to leave our side alone. They complain a bit about how ill their daughter is. Then nurse leaves and they shut the lights off for the entire room again. My husband immediately turns on ours and calls through the curtain that we need our lights on. Silence. Our nurse comes in to attend to my daughter's IV and they attempt to get her to force us to leave the lights off. Our nurse basically tells them to knock it off. Then they start pushing for more space. They attempt to push our chair away from where my husband is sitting. They put their chair way over on our side of the room, pushing the curtain into our faces essentially. My husband pushes it back. 
They call and complain, rinse and repeat. Finally, a room in the PICU opens up and we are told that we would be admitted in an hour. Entitled parents complain that they asked for a private room first. The nurse explains that we are being admitted, not given a private room in the ED. The entitled parents demand that they be admitted first because their daughter is so much sicker. The nurse says that there is no reason for her to even be admitted and she probably just needs to go to the bathroom. Next we've got, not everyone in a suit wants to sell you a car. I'm a practicing attorney in an area known for many jerks being inherent to the local population. This incident occurred earlier today and I just got the time to type this out. Just to set the stage, I wear a suit until I go to bed and I'm just over 6 feet and 250 pounds. I own a heavily modified car, so I take it to the performance shop I had do the modifications every 2,000 miles or so for technical inspections and to dial in the tune. With the changing season and a few new components, we moved it to once every 500 miles to make sure everything's all proper, which means I'm having the car for a look over just about each week since I commute around 40 miles. Across the street from the shop is a dealership for very high-end cars. Specifically, one side serves a high-end British automaker known for ultra-luxury work and an Italian brand known for being gaudy. I'm a bit of a gearhead, so I've taken to walking across the street to chat up the employees and to see if there's anything exciting enough for me to want to get a model car of for my desk in their inventory. I'm on good terms with the staff there since a couple of them are former clients for rather exciting speeding tickets and the like and my girlfriend is a sales representative at an Audi dealership in the same network. I'm examining a gorgeous green coupe and waiting for a coffee an employee had gone to get since these dealerships have expensive coffee machines and darn it, they're gonna use them, especially for a friend. I feel a tap on my shoulder and turn around only to find what could be described as just under five feet of dark skin wrapped around silicone in the vague facsimile of a person looking at me with mild impatience and attired in booty shorts and some sort of almost inadequate crop top and colors that can be described as a violent and sticky violation of one's eye sockets and a pair of worryingly high heels. Just to be clear, in most cases, prospective customers make an appointment so that product specialists can devote their full attention to the needs of the client. At this moment, us and a local Instagrammer were the only people on the showroom floor. Can I help you? I ask. A mistake, to be sure. But one easy to make when you get through law school on customer service jobs. This entity proceeds to ask questions of me about the SUV offering of this brand. Power, engines, what can fit in it, that sort of stuff. Being a gearhead, I actually know many of the things she asks or can refer to a piece of laminated paper on a nearby example. Then she asks me for a test drive. Firstly, I don't work there. And secondly, I don't believe test drives happen for that level of car without one having already contracted to buy it. I attempt to answer her with an, I'm sorry ma'am, but I cannot do that as I don't work here. This does not fly. She raises her voice and interrupts me before I can inform her of my lack of employment at the establishment. It's because of how I look, isn't it? Was what passed from the most definitely augmented lips. Firstly, no. And secondly, I don't work here. I try to be concise, already shifting into a mode of how I speak when speaking to the court. Listen here, you deceitful jerk. Her words, not mine. I've seen you up in here talking with the salesmen's. I remember that unneeded plural very clearly. And I know you work with them. So let me test drive this car. And I'll forget about how rude you've been. She starts approaching very close at this point. Ma'am, I don't work here. And if I did, it would be hard to get a test drive anyway. I would be interrupted by one hand adorned with pink claws grabbing me by my necktie and dragging me down to her level. I remind you that I'm 6 foot 1 and 250 pounds and my head has been jerked down a good foot. My glasses fall to the floor. Shut up and get me those darn keys before I tell your manager. It's at this point that my friend returns to the showroom with the coffee from the attached dealership and witnesses this goblin assailing his friend. He strides over, puts on a wide smile and asks, what's wrong? She turns on her heel, resulting in a rather unpleasant crunch as her heel crushes the lens of my glasses. I didn't quite catch her rant directed at the real employee, but I did finally have enough of this. I pulled my card from my pocket, 
thrust it in her face, and spoke with the same voice I use in court to make conclusions, and the same little smile. Ma'am, I do not work here. I am an attorney who is friends with several employees here. I just answered your questions because I love the products of this brand and I know some things about it. Now, I am going to ask that either you hand over a check for $600 to cover damages you have inflicted upon my glasses, or I will get the police involved for the battery you performed upon my person. I then crossed my arms, and after a moment of looking between me and the door and the security cameras, she sighs and surprisingly pulls out a checkbook and writes me a check for the damages. I put it in my pocket and observe the general manager of the dealership, who had seen it happen on camera, rush out and ban her on the spot for assaulting somebody in his dealership before security, who had been holding back until a manager gave word, escorted her out. The manager apologized profusely and gave me a fancy paperweight for free for my troubles. I thanked him and left after drinking the coffee. I got my prescription sunglasses from the car so I'd be able to drive safely before calling up my boss, one of the partners at the firm, to tell him my side of events in case she tried something with the card I gave her. I took the check to her bank once the adjustments on my car were done and surprisingly it cashed out without incident. I'm going to the optometrist tomorrow to get new glasses and according to my girlfriend, she actually got the notice at her dealership to deny service to that cretin as well. So, all's well that ends well. What kind of car do you drive? Please let me know. Next we've got, Entitled Mom Goes Off Because Wife and I Spend Our Money on Things We Need. A bit of background. I moved out of home when I was 18. I am now 30 and married, living with my wife. Since I left my home 12 years ago, I have worked full time, including 10 years in the military. I am completely independent from my parents and have been the entire time. I have never relied on or asked them for anything. I have two sisters who still live at home. They both work casual and study. They are both shocking with money, constantly going overseas on holidays or to concerts and festivals with friends, just blowing every cent they earn. Their choice though, good on them. Me, I've been on one overseas holiday for my honeymoon, but that's it. I save money every week and always have. I have fun too, I just make sure that if I can help it, I don't go backwards. Yet, for some reason, Entitled Mom is always on my back about money. Not my sisters, just me. Whenever I spend anything, it's a big deal. She also has this thing about my wife not earning enough. She works full time and makes a decent salary, just not quite what mine is. It doesn't matter. We're a team and my wife is amazing. She does a lot for us in so many other aspects of our life. Entitled Mom is always saying that my wife is just playing me for my money and one of these days she will leave me and take half, which she apparently hasn't earned. Well, that's all BS. My wife and I have a great marriage. She's an amazing woman, and even if she did become unhappy and want to leave, she would absolutely deserve half, as income is only a small part of what someone brings to a marriage, and my wife is an absolute star. Honestly, I think it just makes Entitled Mom mad that we don't need her. So anyway, the story. Recently, there was a large hailstorm in my city. There was widespread damage. Thousands of vehicles were destroyed, including my wife's car. Luckily, the car was insured and after a couple of weeks, we received a decent payout. Although my wife loved her car, we did see this as a bit of a blessing in disguise as we had an old personal loan outstanding as well as a credit card with a little owing also. The plan was to completely pay off both of these, close the accounts, and with what was left, buy my wife a car. Then, if there was still some left, we would put some extra cash against our home loan. Yes, I know it sounds like we are drowning in debt. I assure you, we are not. Our situation is very manageable. We make all payments on time and still manage to put something away every week for ourselves. So anyway, this was all a few weeks back and since then, we have done all of the above as planned. We are extremely happy as we have wiped a lot of our debt. Everything except the home loan. And my wife loves her new car despite it being a bit of a downgrade. Since all of this occurred, I had not heard from Entitled Mom. My parents are retired and traveling the country in a caravan, so I'm not bothered by this. Yesterday, I decided to call and check in. Things are normal at first. Conversation is pleasant, but I can tell Entitled Mom has something on her mind, so I ask if something's wrong. The floodgates are opened. She's been holding this in for weeks. I paraphrase, but here's how it went down. Entitled Mom, I'll tell you what's wrong. Your wife spending $35,000 on a car 
when you have a home loan to think about. Your wife is manipulative and selfish, and you are a gutless pushover. She will send you broke, and your father and I won't be there to pick up the pieces. Me. Whoa, what the heck? First of all, why on earth do you think we spent that on a car? Where would you have even got that number from? Reminder, I haven't spoken to Entitled Mom in weeks. As far as I know, she had no idea we had bought the car yet. Your sister showed me your wife's Snapchat story. There was a photo of the car with the price in the window, so don't lie to me. Me. Well, that photo was taken before we even spoke with a dealer. The price in the window was $32,000, not $35,000, and that was the original price. There was a sale on, dropping at $6,000, and I was able to talk them down further, $3,000. On top of all that, my mother-in-law gave my wife some of her nan's inheritance to go towards it. Entitled mom, casually moving past the part where she was wrong. Well then, tell me what you paid for it. You know what? No, I don't owe you an explanation. And after the way you just attacked me, you won't get one. If you wanted to know, maybe you could have called and asked how we were going with the car situation at some point over the last few weeks, but I haven't heard from you, and our finances are none of your business anyway. Entitled mom hangs up. Haven't heard a thing from her in days now, and don't expect to for a while. Spoke to my dad. His advice is, don't poke the bear. Makes me laugh. Apparently, my wife is manipulative, and I am a pushover. Yeah, sure. Might be time to go no contact for a bit. Have your parents ever tried to control what you spend your money on? Let me know, I'd really love to hear from you. Next we've got, entitled parents sit outside and let their spawn run amok in a restaurant. Cast, we've got the staff, and we've got entitled dad, and we've got their spawn. There's a cafe near my apartment that I've been going to a couple times a week for the last month-ish. By this point, the staff all know me as I go in at random times of the day and I tip really well in a non-tipping culture because I'm usually there for a couple hours and just have tea. On Saturday, I had some work to do, so I brought my laptop and had a working dinner. The front of the cafe was packed, so I went to sit in the back, very separated from the rest of the cafe, up some stairs, past some offices, etc. I soon found out why the back was empty. Within minutes of sitting down, a herd of screaming banshees ran by. Enter the spawn. You see, this cafe has an enclosed kids' playroom in the back that's full of toys, drawing material, and stuff for them to do so they can play while the parents eat. I had been there before when kids were in there, and there was some noise, because they make noise, but it was never bad, because the parents always sat at the table by the play area and kept them under control. This was not the case with these parents. These parents were nowhere to be seen in the area and had just left their three spawn there unsupervised while they had dinner. I later found out they weren't even in the restaurant. They were in a separate outdoor seating area that was basically as far away from the playroom as you can get. I assume that's why they never heard the screams. After about 10 minutes of watching them run around in the back restaurant area, not the playroom, screaming, throwing toys, bumping into tables and servers, and generally wreaking havoc, I was pretty upset. Eventually, inevitably, one got hurt and went screaming and running to dad through the restaurant. Entitled dad one comes back, herds the spawn back into the playroom, talks to them for a few minutes, and then leaves. Within minutes, the spawn are back out doing the same thing. The servers kept apologizing to me, but there wasn't anything they could do, and it wasn't their fault. Apparently, the Entitled Dads had decided to periodically check on the spawn because a little bit earlier, Entitled Dad 2 showed up and stood there watching them wreak havoc on the restaurant. He talked to them, but didn't stop them from throwing a toy at a server or running and screaming and bumping into stuff. Basically, he just didn't care. I signaled one of the servers to come over, and he apologized again and said there was an empty table up front I could move to. I told him no problem, winked, and said, I hope that dad speaks English. I'm currently in a non-English speaking country. I then threw the Karen fit to end all Karen fits. I raged about how horrible their kids are and how the parents should be shamed for letting their kids behave in such a manner and terrorize an entire restaurant because they were too lazy to be parents. The server had his back to the entitled dad and kept apologizing, but he was actually cracking up because he knows me and knows I'm generally a chill person. I ranted away for several minutes about the spawn and their shameful parents basically ripping them apart. Then I demanded they move me away from the little terrors. When we got up front, he told the other servers what I had done and they all started cracking up. 
They came over to thank me for saying what they couldn't, and they proceeded to buy me a drink and thanks. Within minutes, I saw Entitled Dad 2 herd the kids through the restaurant and out onto the patio so they would be with their parents. I could still hear them screaming and they were running around like crazy, but at least now they were only harassing their own family instead of random strangers. Occasionally, I use the loud American complainer reputation to do some good, have also pulled it out on cue jumpers on a few occasions. Entitled Aunt expects us to give her our property. Cast, we've got my mom. We've got Entitled Aunt. We've got my jerk cousins. They'll come in later. And we've got me. So there's a little bit of backstory before we get into this. Entitled Aunt has two kids. Cousin one, who's around 10, and cousin two, who is six. These kids are the biggest brats ever. Entitled Aunt just lets them do whatever they want. They're also homeschooled, and their curriculum consists of building sheds and gardening. They aren't very literate. Because they've been homeschooled practically all their life, they haven't had much opportunity to be around other kids, as Entitled Aunt is extremely overprotective. She also comes sobbing to us after almost every time she gets fired from her job to ask us for increasingly large sums of money, which she spends on expensive things. They seem to like my brother best, so whenever they come over or we go over to their house, they always seem to want to play with him. Cousin 1 and Cousin 2 also have no concept of privacy and like to barge into my siblings' rooms just because, which has led to some pretty uncomfortable encounters. Don't really feel like I should delve into this on this post. They also have a dog, which they keep in their extremely small backyard, and it's not trained. The Story Entitled Aunt calls up my mother a few weeks ago. They call back and forth about once a week. Entitled Aunt was thinking of moving because she has realized her house is too small for her two kids, her husband, and an overactive dog that they keep locked up in the kitchen when they have guests. At the time, we were also thinking of moving, so Entitled Aunt had the great idea of suggesting that we sever our property so that she can live with us. We have about four acres of property, not including a strip of forest that we own. My mother, being a bit of a pushover, thinks that it's a good idea. But our grandparents, who I'd prefer live with us, also wanted to at the time. And while our property is large, it's not large enough for everyone. My mother brings up that fact, and then Entitled Aunt changes her idea from severing our property to building an extension on our house so that we can live in the same house. And not only does she want to build an extension on our house, she wants us to pay for it. Plumbing, utilities, electrical, everything. And the house that they want isn't exactly small. I think my dad managed to talk some sense into my mother about how crazy the idea was, and my mother seemed to agree. So when Entitled Aunt comes over the next week, my mother and Entitled Aunt have the following conversation. Entitled Aunt So, have you thought about what we talked about last week? Mom Yes, and I don't think it's a good idea for us to sever our property and pay for your house. But why not? Your kids love Cousin 1 and Cousin 2, and they'd love to live with them. Mom We don't have the money to build two more extra houses on our property, Entitled Aunt especially with how large you want yours to be. At that point, Cousin 1 and Cousin 2 chimed in with how much they loved us and wanted to live with us, which Entitled Aunt clearly put them up to. Thankfully, my mother managed to stand her ground on our decision. Mom, Entitled Aunt, you cannot live with us. If you want a bigger house, just move. But we can't. My husband and I don't work, and my kids are getting taught by me. This also isn't the first time that Entitled Aunt and my uncle haven't had jobs. They refuse to send their kids to school, which makes working difficult, and they end up getting fired and trying to get money from my family. And my mother normally gives it out. I think at that point, she had gotten fed up with Entitled Aunt and had asked them politely to leave, which resulted in Entitled Aunt calling my mom a bunch of names and then leaving with her sobbing and screaming kids in tow. We haven't seen them since, and my mother avoids her at all family gatherings. Edit. To further expand on what I mean by not very literate, I mean that they can read, just not at the level that they should be reading at that age. Would you ever let an entitled family member live with you? I know I sure wouldn't. Goblin breaks my stuff 
Karen refuses to pay. Okay, let's start with the situation. My workshop is located in an office building no longer in use. As a result, they opened it up to various smaller companies to work there. I only recently opened the workshop at this location and am still very busy with moving as well as getting to know what everyone does. There are mostly online shops and artists who have a room there. The hallways where I have my office is locked off with an access code. It started on a Sunday. I like working on Sundays because there's nobody in the building. So music on and start working. What I do in my workshop is working with leather, faux furs and faux leathers. So I have an array of scissors, needles, punches and pliers that would not be misplaced in a Lovecraft horror scene. Only I need to go to the bathroom. So I close the door, but I did not lock it. In hindsight, I should have locked it and from now on I do that. But at the moment, there was no one. We all know each other, so what could have gone wrong? Famous last words. So I come back to the workshop with my door opened. Strange, I had closed the door, right? I discover, much to my surprise, that there was a kid, perhaps six, in the workshop nosing around. There are a few small issues with it. One comes to my mind when I see the nice shiny metal of my scissors. These scissors are my pride. They are high strength carbon steel alloy and I keep them razor sharp, perhaps even sharper. They are perfect for cutting through synthetic fabrics, different leathers and to my own frustration, human skin if you don't pay attention. We are talking about a 28 centimeter, 11 freedom inches, long blade, hollow ground and polished. So I got a bit nervous when I saw the kid with that tool. I also didn't want them to get scared and drop the scissors. They do not act well when dropped. Now, there were no parents with the kid at that moment, so I approached them to ask what they were doing here, and more importantly, for my scissors back. No luck in getting my quite expensive scissors back, so I got a bit sterner. I do not want to grab for the scissors, as that would be dangerous for us. Now, when I talk stern, I do raise my voice a bit, and it does carry. So finally, the mother made an appearance. Apparently, learning after the fact, she was visiting a therapist with her kid figures. At first, I was quite nice. I asked the mother for my scissors back and to remove her kid from my workshop. The mother also did not have luck getting my scissors back and her kid now became frustrated that two people were asking for her newfound toy back. Following conversation translated from Dutch, entitled Mom. Sure, there is no harm in letting her play with it a bit longer. Me. Ma'am, I have work to do and those scissors are quite dangerous. There's a reason I have that on the wall. And I pointed to a large, well-equipped industry first aid kit. Then why is she here? Me. Beats me, but I do have to ask you to leave. This is no place for her. My following error was to take a step to entitled kid with my hand open and making a gesture for the scissors. She gave a cry and threw the scissors at the ground. It dropped on its tip and did me a kind job of breaking apart. It is said that a Dutch guy can swear for two minutes long, uninterrupted, without repeating themselves, and at that moment, I had to keep myself from not teaching the kid a whole new vocabulary of words that would make the devil ask if you can keep it civilized. It's not their fault. It hardly ever is at that age. I took the scissors and the tip carefully from the ground. It was about a centimeter long, and there was no way I could grind the blade back to repair the damage, so I looked at the mother. This is a problem. Yeah, sorry. Here, have a tenner. This should be enough. Not even close. These scissors cost me about 120 euros a piece. That is 120 euros wholesale price, not retail. I want it replaced, not to make a profit on it. For a moment, I saw her soul leave her body. Well, you shouldn't have left your door open. Technically, she was right. But technically, you should always watch your kid. Me. The door was closed, just not locked. I do ask for some compensation for the breaking of my tool since you are responsible for your kid. A kid who was looking with tears in her eyes to the scissors I was holding. No, you will not get it. I do not know why, but she calmly took some cash from her wallet, threw it at me with the words, take your money, and left, roughly pulling on Entitled Kid's arm, who started to cry at this point. The only consolidation was that what she threw at me was a bit more than the cost of new scissors. 
so technically I made a profit. Do you have any craft work that you do, such as leather work? I'd love to hear about it. Entitled Aunt makes demands in our home after she left my mom in the gutter. This saga involves my mom and her sister, aka Entitled Aunt, and my family. I apologize in advance for the lengthy background, but I needed to give you a sense of how truly entitled this woman is. Background Shortly after my mom and dad had me, they decided to move from California to Florida. They were immigrants to this country and therefore were really poor at this time, and my mom was encouraged by Entitled Aunt to move to Central Florida so that family can be close and it was fairly cheap. Well, things didn't work out as planned because shortly after the move, my mom found out that my dad had been cheating and got the other woman pregnant and they promptly divorced. But my dad got everything while my mom got sole custody of me and my older bro. Basically, she had no home, car, phone, nothing. The only place she knew was Entitled Ann's house, which was large due to her husband's fairly successful construction company. And per my mom's words, the following happened. My mom knocked on the door and saw that Entitled Aunt opened it just a slit, looked at her for a solid second, and promptly shut and locked the door. My mom told me she knew what that meant and didn't push it any further other than to just break down and cry as she walked down the road with us. My mom is a strong woman and builds relationships fast and strong, a trait an introvert like me never got. So she begged her boss for a loan, got a cheap car and a phone, and she sent me being that I was basically still an infant at this point, back to her home country to be raised by my grandma because she knew she was in no state to take care of a baby, but at least she can take care of a toddler, big bro. And she worked her butt off to afford an apartment, food and daycare, with her goal being to eventually bring me back home. It was only after she met my future stepfather that she was finally able to do that. The story, about 15 years later due to the recession of 08, Entitled Aunt's husband's business flopped and they lost their home and all their savings and were hotel surfing for a few years until my parents, who were doing a lot better now, offered a welcome hand for them to stay with us since my mom is a bigger person than I'll ever be. When she arrived with her family, Entitled Aunt immediately demanded two rooms be allocated to her and the use of one of my parents' cars and my mom told her it was the couches or nothing and that shut her up real quick. So every day I came home from school, I had to walk past them bumming on the couches and my cousins weren't exactly pleasant to be around either. They always gave a snobbish, I'm better than you vibe and generally ignored you to text on their phones and entitled aunt avoided and never spoke to me while her husband was out for weeks doing odd jobs. They didn't do anything around the house but my parents didn't care as long as they didn't make a mess and my mom was more than happy to share food since at least Entitled Aunt knew how to make cuisine from their home country. The breaking point came after week two though, when my mom had prepared food for a family party and had it on the counters ready to be transferred before she had to head out to do her nails. When she came back, everything was gone. This was enough food to feed like 20 people and they somehow managed to clean out more than half of it and my mom was mad. I remember hearing them yelling and arguing. I was told later of what was said, that Entitled Aunt was complaining about our crab hospitality and that if we had food then we needed to share it, that they were being forced to sleep on couches while we kept our rooms, etc. And when my mom pointed out what she did all those years back, Entitled Aunt retorted that she didn't want bums in her home and with that, Entitled Aunt was kicked out. Entitled Aunt apparently called my grandma to rant and complain. Now Entitled Aunt only ever calls my grandma to beg for money and never spoke to her otherwise and my mom is considered the golden child in the family and calls her mom daily so immediately grandma shut her down and told her she deserves what happened and that she feels sorry for the kids but now that they're teenagers they're grown enough that she, grandma, doesn't need to be sending Entitled Aunt money especially when Entitled Aunt is fully capable of working. Entitled Aunt apparently moved into uncles who's too nice of a guy, house and bummed on their couches for four to six months before she was kicked out by my aunt after my mom told her over casual chat what Entitled Aunt did to uncle shortly after he immigrated to the US. Last thing my mom ever did for Entitled Aunt was get her a housekeeping job that she quit after two days because it was too hard. The last thing I heard of them 
is that they're still hotel surfing with my now adult cousins and entitled aunt not working and the husband still trying to support them. You are not a customer here, a new breed of Karen. Before I get into it, and just to add a bit of background, I have been a manager in my line of work for over a decade now, and we deal with rude people all the time. I have zero patience for rude people, and I give it back exactly how it's given to me. At my work, I do the post office run each morning, dropping and collecting mail from our P.O. box. Great chance to get out of the office and create new, long ways back to work. Today, we had a parcel pickup slip in there. Nothing unusual with that. We get them all the time. So I collect the parcel and take it back to work with the other mail. When I get back to my desk, I notice that the parcel is from Amazon, addressed to someone who doesn't work here but has our P.O. box details. There is also a contact number for her on the parcel sticker. So, being the kind, caring gentleman that I am, I give her a call. It goes to her voicemail, so I leave a detailed message about the situation and how to contact me. Moments later, I get a call back on my desk phone. Me. Good afternoon, company. This is OP. Her. Hmm. I had a missed call from this number, but I have no idea why you would be calling me because I'm not interested in anything you are selling. Me. Oh no, that's okay. I don't want to sell you anything. We had a parcel in our P.O. box addressed to you. Did you want to come to our office to pick it up? Her. Why do you have a key to my P.O. box? Me. Well, actually, it's our P.O. box. We have had the same one for three years now. So, she explodes. No, it's my P.O. box and that's illegal. Why do you have a key to my P.O. box? I want to speak to your manager. Me. Okay, go for it. I'm the manager. Her. Well, why do you have access to my mail? She yells this whole conversation, but I got sick of writing in caps. Me. I don't. I have access to my mailbox. I go every day and have never seen your mail in my box before. So explain to me why you think you have access to mine. You do realize that I am from this company, right? Her. In a moment of unexpected clarity from her. Well... My P.O. box is, explains the full address, which is almost our address as we have two post offices nearby, but hers needs the suburb name, then East added to it. Easy. Me. Oh, I understand now. Sorry. Well, yeah, looks like Amazon or Australia Post hasn't added that detail to the label sticker, so it's come to the main post office. <laughs> Whoops. Trying to calm her down a bit. Her. Well... When I made the order, I put my details in as I always do. That's how I have them saved on my Amazon profile too. So why did it get sent to you? Me, getting sick of going back and forth with something I have absolutely no time to deal with. How would I know, mate? I don't work for Amazon or the post office. I literally picked up our P.O. box mail and your parcel was with it. I didn't have to call, but I did. I have nothing to do with your mail or your order details. As I've said multiple times now, I'm from my company. Her. Well, this needs to be escalated, and you will need to drop that parcel at my house ASAP, because it's urgent. Me. At this point, I thought my nose started bleeding from inner rage. What the heck? What's not being understood here? Well then, take my parcel back to the post office and tell them about the error. Me. I have absolutely no authority to take a parcel back and have them amend the address. Nope, not gonna happen. You need to come and get it from me, or I can take it back and they will return it to Amazon. I probably could have done more, but really, forget her. This is urgent medicine I need. You buy urgent medicine from Amazon, and they mark it as beauty products on the customs declaration? Bit odd. That's none of your business. Yeah, exactly. None of this should be my business. Now come and get your parcel and stop blowing up at me. Completely unacceptable behavior. I want to lodge a complaint. You're not a customer of ours. You have no grounds to complain. I'm trying to help you. Where is your office? I will come right now, and you better have some answers for me. Beautiful. Here it is. Can't wait to catch up. See you then. She hangs up. I imagine she has slammed down her phone and absolutely obliterated it because of how angry she was. Her hands shaking from rage, she cleans the froth from the insides of her mouth grabs her handbag, 
makes sure she's carrying her Karen ID and heads to her new four-wheel drive that she uses for only city travel. Myself and the other office staff share a great laugh over it and we are currently pacing the room waiting for her to get here. Everyone wants to witness this pure stupidity firsthand. That call was now three hours ago, still not here. Entitled parents at a bookstore ruin books because their kid wanted one. So a few years ago, I used to work at the headquarters of the biggest bookstore chain in my country. I worked in the shipping department and one of my jobs was to take the new books that arrived, weigh them, note the number of pages down and add these to the database and the website for people to order. Now the company headquarters where the shipping department was were right above the main bookstore of the chain. That meant that every day I had to go downstairs with two colleagues, collect the new arrivals and take them upstairs. So one day I went to the first floor where the kids book section is to pick up the books I had to weigh that day. I had to collect about seven books so I decided to carry them all at once. I stacked these books and then I started carrying them. Mind you, these books were heavy as heck but I really wanted to be done with that instead of having to climb four flights of stairs twice. Enter Entitled Kid One of the books I happened to be carrying was a newly arrived kids book and unfortunately it was pretty visible due to the colors on the side etc. The moment the kid spots the book I'm carrying it starts screaming, Mom! Dad! There it is! There it is! I didn't pay much attention and I move towards the stairs. Then I hear the entitled dad say, Go ahead! Take it! I thought he meant to go and get the book from the shelves. It has just been placed to. So I turned my back and kept walking. Then suddenly I hear a voice shouting, Excuse me! Pretty loud. I turned around and the entitled mom was standing there looking at me. Before I could say anything, she goes, How dare you turn your back to my son? Me. I don't understand. You work here and that's how you treat customers that want to buy your products? Me. Ma'am, I don't work in this department. If you're looking for a specific book, you can ask the people that work here. Well, your tag says you work here. The tag says I work in this company, not in this specific department. Please let me do my job. Entitled Dad. How dare you talk to us like that. Now hand over this book. My son needs it. Now mind you, this book was the fourth of the stack, so I had to leave the heavy stack somewhere, give them the book, and then lift it again. Also, I had started to feel the strain on my arms and I just wanted to go upstairs and finish my job. Me. Well, unfortunately, I cannot give you this specific book, but they just arrived and if you go to the shelves back there, you'll find more copies of it. Entitled Kid. But I want this one. You heard my son. Now give me this book you're holding or I'll call your manager. Me. Miss, I can't do that. Then suddenly the kid comes up to me and tries to reach for the book and grab it. I try to move away, but it was too late. The kid, instead of grabbing the book, which was impossible because it had three books on top of it, drops the whole stack and they fall down. Now, most of the books were ruined, not completely ruined, but bent and a couple of torn pages. We obviously cannot sell books like that, so the damage was done. Entitled Dad. Well, you see what you did? You almost injured my kid. I grabbed the book from the floor. It had a bent cover and handed it to the kid. Me. Happy now? Entitled Mom. Do you expect me to pay for this ruined book? It's your fault and you're a dangerous man. You almost hurt him. At that moment, my manager, who was one of the best people I have ever met and really liked me a lot, comes over. The entitled mom and entitled dad are screaming at him to get me fired for causing harm to their beloved brat who was just silently browsing other shelves as if nothing had happened and that I had to pay for the book personally. Yeah, not company money, but for the book price to be withheld from my salary. Then my manager says, We have CCTV. Please wait right here so we can check your accusations because they are serious. The moment he said that, all colors left entitled mom's face. She started saying the typical, You don't need to. It's not necessary. But nothing came out of it. Now the security room is directly upstairs. As I said, it was the headquarters of the entire company. So the process only took about half an hour. I had to remain downstairs with the entitled family who gave me glaring looks all that time. In the end, they had to pay the full price for all the books they ruined, which was a lot, mind you, and then they had to take them with them. In the end though, the entitled kid took the book he wanted. Karen yells at me 
for not taking away her dirty dishes at a Chinese restaurant. This story happened when I was 16 and going through an emo phase, so my hair was dyed black. Also, before I get started, I'm just going to say that I'm not Asian and my ancestry tree looks like a highlighted map of Europe with a couple of spots missing. At the time, I was dating this girl from two towns over. This girl and I had been dating for about four months when she decided to introduce me to her grandparents and her opinion of her grandparents mattered much more than her jerk parents. So on a Sunday, I dressed up in some of the nicest clothes that actually fit me and weren't from Goodwill, which was a pair of black dress pants and black polo shirt and a white tie. After church, her grandparents decided to treat her and I to a lunch at one of those Chinese buffet style restaurants. I was doing great with the grandparents and was enjoying my meal. When it comes to filling up my plate again, I've always taken my dirty plate with me whenever I go to get more food because I don't like to have the wait staff carry plate after plate after plate of food. While on my way to get my third plate, I hear an excuse me sir from behind. I didn't really pay attention because I was an unemployed high school student at this time and no one at that point had called me sir. I continued walking towards the food when I hear the same voice say, Excuse me, waiter! A hand then grabbed my shoulder and spun me around. And this, my friends, was my first ever encounter with a Karen. I was shocked and said, The heck do you think you're doing? I've never liked people touching me without warning. She said, What did you say to me, you little jerk? I said, You just grabbed me out of nowhere. The lady said, well, if you would have turned around, I wouldn't have had to grab you. Now take the dirty plates off my table since you're heading to the back. That's when I caught on to it. Lady, I don't work here. I just reuse the plates because I don't like leaving a mess when I don't have to. The lady then dug her finger into my chest. You're wearing the uniform. I don't care if you're not on the clock. Just do what I tell you to. I started getting frustrated at that point. I don't work here. I've never worked here. So don't lay your grubby fingers on me or I'll wind up doing something that'll make me look bad to my girlfriend's grandparents. The lady tried to shove me with one hand and I flipped her onto her back. At this point, a bunch of people saw what happened and started swarming around trying to separate me from the lady. Police were called and of course she tried playing victim, saying I came at her out of nowhere. I said my side of the story and pointed out the fact that I was a minor and told them to watch the security camera footage and of course, I was the one whose story lined up with what was shown. In the end, no one was arrested, but we were both banned from that restaurant. Also, the girlfriend's grandparents didn't like the fact that I wound up flipping this lady during lunch and the girl and I broke up about three days later. I do on occasion go to that restaurant. I'm about a full six inches taller now and actually able to grow facial hair and I don't look like an emo boy anymore. Speaking of Chinese food, what is your favorite food of all time? Entitled Stepmom Uses Doorbell to Page Her Kids This is a story about my entitled stepmom and my brothers. While my mom was involved, she was a minor player. This also took place before cell phones. Cast, we've got me, I was 15 at the time. We've got Entitled Stepmom. We've got Tiger, my middle bro who's 13. We've got Rabbit, youngest bro who's 9. We've got Mom married to entitled stepmom and biological parent. The nicknames came from our mom and according to her, our personalities matched the Winnie the Pooh characters. Mom calls me Eeyore. We lived in what's known as a three family house. Entitled stepmom and mom owned the house and we used the first and second floors, but rented out the third. For those that are not aware, a three family house is a freestanding house with three separate apartments, usually one per floor, connected by a main hallway. The first floor was used as a living room, kitchen, dining room, and home offices, while the second floor is where the bedrooms are and the playrooms. Since these are considered separate apartments, the doors to each apartment was pretty thick and it was hard to hear through the door. Also, because cell phones were not a thing yet, if you wanted to get a hold of your kid that was on the second floor, you had to yell pretty loudly in the hallway up the stairs. Sometimes my poor entitled stepmom had to actually climb the stairs to get a hold of someone. Eventually, my entitled stepmom decides that enough is enough and she is going to install a doorbell on the second floor and put the button on the first floor. That way, if she needs one of us, she can just hit the button. So she goes out, 
purchases and installs it, then sits us down and tells us about the bell and what it means when it rings. Also, she assigns each of us a number of rings. Rabbit is one, Tiger is two, while I am three. When the doorbell is rung, we are to pause whatever we are doing, go downstairs and walk into the living room and ask what's up. We couldn't walk downstairs and ask from the doorway. We had to physically walk into the living room several steps so she could see us from her spot on the couch. That's right. My entitled stepmom installed the doorbell in a spot she could reach without getting off the couch. Now sometimes we were paged for normal things, like checking our homework or to do the dishes. Other times we were called for dumb things, like filling her wine glass with the boxed wine or getting her a glass of water. Oh, and the water had to be cold, no ice, but you had to let the faucet run for 30 seconds. The problem started to occur because as I said, she had installed the button for the doorbell in easy reach of her position on the couch. In fact, she installed it on the side of the coffee table where her knees were, which led to several accidental activations and Rabbit would run downstairs to see what's going on. He would walk into the living room and ask what's up. Entitled Stepmom would be confused since she couldn't hear the doorbell upstairs and there was no way she accidentally hit the button since that was impossible. After like a month of Rabbit appearing, after being accidentally beckoned, he started yelling at Entitled Stepmom, which almost always ended up with Rabbit losing electronics for the day. This became such a common occurrence that my mom finally stood up to Entitled Stepmom and asked for the doorbell to be changed to two rings for Rabbit, three for Tiger, and four for me. Unfortunately, Entitled Stepmom was stuck in her ways and didn't see this as a problem for her to solve. It was our job to know if it was accidental or not, which again, Rabbit would only know if he went downstairs. Then my mom asked to switch it so that I was one, Tiger was two, and Rabbit was three. Her reasoning was that I was more even-leveled and would be forgiving of an accidental ring. Entitled Stepmom said that was too confusing for us and she decided to keep the order the same. I guess for some reason, she thought we couldn't understand the difference between one and three but we were required to get high marks in math. Anyways, eventually you get sick and tired of hearing the doorbell, even when it wasn't calling you. I replaced the battery in both the button and the ringer several times with dead batteries. Eventually, I ran out of spare dead batteries. One day, I was playing video games in the playroom while Tiger was reading a book in his room, which due to the orientation of the house, I could see him where he was at. Since the bell goes off twice, Tiger proceeds to continue to read his book. Two more rings and a frustrated sigh from Tiger. Another minute passes with two more bell rings. After the third group, Tiger throws his book across his room, stands up and grabs a metal baseball bat. Wordlessly, he runs out of his room and whacks that doorbell off the wall. While it was lying on the floor, he proceeded to hit it two more times to make sure it was done for. He gently put the bat back in his room and picked up his book from the floor. After witnessing this, I hear my entitled stepmom storming up the stairs, so I quickly picked up my jaw from the floor. Entitled stepmom rips open the door and demands to know why Tiger was not responding to the doorbell. He stands up and very calmly states he didn't hear any bell. Entitled stepmom looks up at the wall where the former ringer was and then followed the wall down to the floor where the doorbell lay demolished. Entitled Stepmom starts to get herself into a tizzy, wondering what happened to the doorbell, and I reply without pausing my game. Must have fallen. To this day, I have no idea where I got the bravery to lie straight to her face. While I misbehaved for talking back, ignoring her, or even being evasive, being sneaky, I did not lie. Entitled Stepmom, while self-absorbed, prided herself on me always telling the truth so she couldn't call me a liar without hurting her own pride. She decides that it must have fallen and smashed itself into a thousand pieces. She moves on, tells Tiger he needs to go downstairs and find the TV remote for her. Mom looked at the remains later and she knew it had not fallen. Luckily for us, Entitled Stepmom decided the doorbell was inefficient and decided all by herself that an intercom would have been better. Turns out she got the idea from a magazine that I just happened to leave on the coffee table, open to an advertisement for an intercom. Oh well.
I made my boss retire and took her lab equipment as a trophy. I'm a second year graduate student going for a PhD in biochemistry. As such, I'm simultaneously both a student and government employee working for my university as a researcher. The way my program is laid out, you take a general course for the first semester, then rotate into three or more labs, doing work for and learning techniques from the professors running said labs for a few months before moving on. After your third rotation in a lab, you're allowed to join the lab permanently as you work on your thesis project. As far as my circumstances went, I didn't like my first lab. Everyone had a thick Chinese accent that made it hard to really hear what the professor slash lab techs were saying, although they were great people. The second lab didn't have funding to pay me as a grad student, leaving me with my third rotation lab. I opted to join that lab as the project seemed extremely interesting and was in neuroscience, meaning I would be able to learn techniques others in my program would not, and I was very interested by that prospect. About a week after joining, the head of the biochemistry department reached out to me. Apparently, the older students I know had gone to him with concerns about the professor I would be working with, so he started digging. Apparently, the neuro and molecular medicine programs no longer allow her to take graduate students from their programs at all because she was known for having fits, throwing tantrums, throwing things, and being an all-around jerk in general. I later found out that she was read the riot act on multiple occasions and tried to deny maternity leave to a pregnant student from one of the programs which later blacklisted her because she couldn't understand why a student, who was about 28 at the time, would get pregnant just to give you some context for her demeanor. I was concerned by the rumors, but it seemed to be a stark contrast to the person I was working with. Boy, was I wrong about that. I was told to watch out and keep the department in the loop. Fast forward a few months and progress has slowed to a crawl. The project I had been working on turned out to be wrong and the preliminary data was done by an undergraduate student who, upon revisiting the lab, couldn't replicate her own results because she messed up her data a bit to seem better so she could get out of the lab faster. Fast forward again and communication between my boss and I have broken down. Every email I receive has text in bold, italicized, and underlined font to get it clearly across that she was talking down to me. She no longer offers me help, stating that she doesn't have time for me, but whenever something goes wrong or doesn't work, I'd be asked, why didn't you ask for help? She was hypocritical or self-contradicting on most points, however it best suited her at the time. I found myself walking much more quickly past her office to avoid eye contact and the hour and a half long lectures slash rants that would normally follow. Worked later hours to enjoy the peace and quiet of night. One project I was working on involved injecting lentivirus an HIV-based agent used essentially as a molecular syringe to get cells to express whatever DNA we wanted them to into the brains of mice, which were either a disease model or a control model. I won't go into detail here, but essentially I had to do practice runs before we spent thousands of dollars on disease model mice and ultra-pure lentivirus. These practices were carried out flawlessly and I showed my boss exactly where I had injected the mice. Again, I won't go into the details. However, every time I showed her where I had injected the practice solution, which was fluorescent, she would say, that's not the region of the brain you're supposed to be injecting. I want the CA1 region of the hippocampus. Unbeknownst to me, this jerk had no idea what that region of the brain looked like and was looking for the wrong part of the brain. She worked in the neuro department, gave me the coordinates to inject into this region herself, and worked alongside labs that specialized in this. After we had well exceeded the amount of practice surgeries permitted in her grant, I realized that she was an idiot and showed her a mouse atlas, highlighting the area of the brain to be injected and showed her a side-by-side -side image comparison to my real injections. Furthermore, the atlas had coordinates that showed you that my injections were as accurate as possible. After a bit of stammering, she brought me outside and pointed to a poster on the wall. I wanted you to do this injection. Why didn't you inject this? She was pointing at a different, further forward region of the brain. I showed her the coordinates she herself had provided me with for the surgery and told her, because you didn't tell me to. By this point, we had one week until the actual surgeries were to be done. In a panic, 
My boss told me to do a practice run with brand new coordinates. This was crappy because it took me a week just to find out if the coordinates worked or not and if they didn't, I wouldn't be able to test any corrections before the surgery. Additionally, she had apparently put off mandatory veterinary training and demanded that I do the new coordinate surgery in front of a vet who, if he had a problem with my techniques, be it with the animal or with sterility of my tools, would not allow me to do the surgery and would effectively end my project. While this wouldn't normally be a problem, my crappy boss was using a neighboring lab's equipment which I had no way of cleaning or sterilizing prior to the surgery. Everything rested on the other lab. Through some miracle, everything in the surgery suite was up to standards. Filters had just been replaced, the place had just been swept, trash removed, and the equipment was recently autoclaved. I got a pass from the vet on my technique, but was told that I couldn't do the surgery for safety reasons. I would have to do it in a more controlled environment with more personal protective gear if I was using lentivirus, which again was impossible since we were borrowing another lab's equipment which couldn't be moved. After some discussion, I'm told by my boss to just throw on a respirator and do the surgery anyways. The day of the surgery comes, I'm ready. I anesthetize, knock out, two of the mice and start the surgery. About half an hour into the surgery, I notice that they've both stopped breathing. This had never happened before. I grab the neighboring lab staff to help and they tried to resuscitate the mice with an adapted form of CPR, but it was no use. They were gone. After 30 practice mice injected this way ended up just fine, these expensive mice had died. I would just like to point out that I have never before, nor have I since lost an animal during surgery. There's one thing I haven't mentioned yet. These mice were supposed to be anesthetized with a drug mixture injection, but since my boss never got the license to obtain that mixture, she disobeyed her approved protocol and had us use other means of anesthetizing the mice. It turns out that this particular line of mice was exceptionally fragile and wouldn't be able to live under our method of anesthesia. However, we were collaborating with another lab which was doing half of the surgeries for us. This lab had the license to obtain and use the mixture. Those mice survived. Due to the disparity between their success and our failure, I'm pointed out as the problem, despite my arguments. Fast forward a few months and my boss and I both arrive at the conclusion that neither of us wants me there anymore. I go to the head of the biochemistry department and tell the biochem head about my decision. He asks me what happened and I said, it just didn't work out. I was still trying to just drop it and let the whole thing just slip into the past. However, it turns out my boss had been angrily writing him behind my back for months about everything that she didn't like. He was extremely tired of it. I was outraged by the fact that instead of talking with me about these things like an adult, she went behind my back to my department head. But what really upset me is that she was also apparently spreading lies about me to the head of my department, hoping she could get me kicked out of the graduate school so her reputation wouldn't get tarnished further and she would continue to take students from my department. After this essay of exposition, cue the revenge. The head of the biochemistry department just set me down, told me that he would give me a list of grievances levied against me by my boss and asked me to address them in a formal letter which would be sent in to a governing committee which would deliberate on what course of action the department should take with me leaving the lab. The letter included lies that I would have to disprove. This was easily done and I was able to cite witnesses as well. Blamed me for the deaths of the expensive animals and wasting the lentivirus and several other points. I took my time writing a rebuttal letter. After approximately 24 pages, I was satisfied with my work. I outlined how the premise for my project was based on falsified data, how my boss ignored her IACUC approved surgery protocol for convenience which actually led to the deaths of the animals appended with an email from the veterinarian regarding this to support my claim. How my boss unnecessarily used animals for training surgeries beyond three times the allowed amount in her protocol solely because she couldn't even identify the region she wanted me to inject. How she would constantly harass, threaten, and demean me with witnesses from the neighboring lab cited. How she would constantly forget even talking to me about things and claim that I was lying about things she witnessed. I honestly think she had Alzheimer's, but the neighboring lab thinks it's a form of traumatic brain injury. I even included a note to EHS, the safety department, 
about the breach and safety protocol regarding use of lentivirus without proper airflow control and without proper personal protective equipment. Every single documented safety violation, protocol violation, harassment, or threat was included in my letter. I didn't hear back from the head of the department, but word got around fast through the department even though it was supposed to be secret. The professor was blacklisted from the university as a whole and could no longer take on students from any program, meaning she could only hire lab techs and postdocs. Additionally, the only other person in her lab who basically carried the lab and knew everything just left today. With that, the lab has officially been retired. My old boss is no longer with the university and I even got to enjoy going through her lab equipment to appropriate for my new lab since it was all technically property of the university. It was the greatest feeling of satisfaction I've ever had. My ex-girlfriend has a question about her taxes. This one is sort of indirect, but it happened a few years ago as my ex-girlfriend was moving out. It was an amicable end to a somewhat rocky relationship and she's packing up some of her things. She comes across her city income tax return from the previous year. She yells to me, do I have to pay the city taxes if I don't live here a whole year? I'd assume so. It's probably prorated somehow. How does that work? I don't know. Maybe call the city and ask them what you need to do. A little later, I'm off in another part of the house and I sort of hear half of this conversation going on where my ex is obviously flustered on the phone and trying to explain something but is clearly getting nowhere. I ignore it. She had been making a number of calls to change her billing address, etc. on various things as she was moving. A little later, I see her. I called the city about my taxes. Okay, what did they say? It was weird. The guy seemed a little confused about what I was asking about. But once he got that I was moving, he asked me for my old address and then asked me for my new address. Then he said I was taken care of. So it's taken care of? Do you have to file a tax return? He said it was taken care of. This seemed a little off to me, but I didn't feel like starting an argument, so I let it go. Not my problem. Two months later, the phone rings. It's my ex. I assume she's looking for something she might have left behind. Hello? I have your water bill. Why do I have your water bill? Huh? It was addressed to me, but it's for the water at your house. That's weird. I remembered her questions about the taxes. You called the city about your taxes. Who did you talk to exactly? The city tax people. I told him I was moving. He asked me for my old and new addresses, and then he said it was taken care of. Are you sure you didn't talk to the water department? I talked to the tax people. Right. I'll check with the city. So I call up the city water department and explain everything you just read above to the guy who answered the phone. So, she called the water department about her taxes? I think that's what happened. And then she managed to accidentally have us put the water bill in her name? Apparently, I doubt she'd do that intentionally. She was moving out. Huh, that's hilarious. Yeah, she wasn't too bright. My parents opened a business solely to shut down their former employer. A little background. My parents grew up very poor, dropped out of school, and while they worked steady jobs, we were very poor when I was growing up. My dad worked in a factory under terrible conditions and my mom stayed at home with my brother and I until we were both old enough to be in school full time. We've always had lots of animals for food as well as lots of pets. Consequently, we learned how to groom dogs and became very good at it. Cue my mom getting a job at a local pet store as a dog groomer. She was hired by the owner who was also a pastor at a church near our home and an assistant principal at a local school. My dad also quit his job at the factory to work with her very soon after. I was maybe eight at the time, so after school I would hang out at the store and help clean, do homework, etc. After working for him for a couple years and amassing quite a large clientele, all the while working for pennies, I think I recall them saying he paid them maybe $150 a week? Both of them, not each. He decided he was going to fire my dad and keep my mom on so he could pay her less. They heard about this though and formed a plan. They would open their own pet store offering grooming services and sell their products barely above cost so he couldn't compete with their prices. They left, taking all of their customers with them and he was left scrambling to find a replacement groomer. Our store eventually became so popular that we moved to a larger location after only a couple of years. By now, I was about 12 
and managing the pet store by myself after school, on weekends and over summer break. I loved it. By the time I was 14, Pet Store Jerk, who had owned his business for at least 15 years, had to shut down. My parents closed their store very shortly after and just continued their grooming business. I'd like to say that the jerk got what he deserved, but I don't know what happened to him after that. I think he was, and maybe still is, a pastor. Lady gets mad that I bought my son an airplane seat. So I have a son who is currently two and a half, but we've been traveling by plane since he was six months old due to our living an 18 hour drive from my family, parents, younger sibling, grandparents, etc. In the US, you generally don't need to buy a plane ticket for a child under two. You can buy a seat, like if you want to bring your baby in their carrier or just want to use a car seat, but they can also be considered a lap child and sit in your lap for free. When my son was around one and a half, we were flying back to my hometown to go visit my family. We were flying on an airline named the opposite of Northeast. On this airline, an adult with a kid under six gets to board right after the A1 through 10-ish boarding numbers and before the A11 through 60 or whatever it is, which was helpful for me to get some extra time to find a seat and settle with my kid. Now, he was under two, so he could have flown for free and sat in my lap. But after the flight we had taken a few months before that, where he was heck on wheels and I was mortified by how terrible we probably made our roommates flights, I decided to buy him a plane ticket so we would have a little more room for our things. I hated to feel like I was inconveniencing other passengers with my child when I had to keep him to such a small confined space to begin with. It was better to give him some extra room in the form of his own seat so as not to crowd others when he wanted to get out of my lap or try to look out the window, etc. Plus, then I could sit between him and provide a buffer for his wayward feet. He was generally, and still is, a really good little traveler, but every one and a half year old has their moments as other parents can understand. I swear I do my best to keep him under control. If you've never flown with a kid under two in your lap, you should know that when you go to check your bags at the airport, you get a normal boarding pass for yourself as well as a boarding pass for your kid that clearly says lap infant across the top of it. Otherwise, if you buy your kid a ticket, they get a normal boarding pass like everybody else with your boarding group slash number. This airline has rows of three seats on either side of a very narrow aisle. I tend to stick to the far back rows just in case I need to leave the seat with him when we're in the air and also to try to put some distance between us and other passengers. So we board with family boarding. I grab two seats all the way in the very back row shove all of our stuff into the seats and go about trying to settle our things in. My son decided to sit in the seat by the window and was watching the ground crew do their thing. I was sitting in the middle seat beside him. The aisle seat was empty and the plane started to fill up. But again, we were at the very last row so most people found a seat before they made it to us and or saw I had a kid with me and decided to sit elsewhere. Can't blame them. When the plane was about three fourths full, I hear someone say, um, excuse me, in a rather snobbish voice. I turn to see a woman, maybe 30s, I'm in my early 20s, with a girl, maybe seven to eight. Before I could even respond, the entitled mother demands that I move to the aisle seat and take my son with me so that her daughter could sit by the window. I want to say that if my son was flying free and was a lap infant, I wouldn't have had an issue with moving to the aisle seat to let the girl sit by the window if the mom had asked me nicely. However, I had purchased two tickets with my own money, which isn't easy to swing when you're a single mom. And even if I moved to the aisle seat, my son would have the middle seat and she'd have to sit apart from her daughter. I was not going to be used as a babysitter for someone else's kid on a flight even if I didn't have my own child to deal with. I tried to explain this to her, went a little something like this. Me. Oh. I would, but I bought two seats, and even if I move, there'd only be one seat open, so you might want to try somewhere else so you both can sit together. There were still entire rows that were empty on the plane at this point. Entitled Mom. You're lying. He's clearly not even two yet, and under two, they fly free and sit in your lap. Please move, now. Me. Yes, they can fly for free in your lap, but I specifically bought him his own ticket so he could have his own seat and more room. There are several rows a bit further forward that are still empty and have window seats. Well, he's small. 
you should just hold him. My daughter wants to sit by the window, and I need to be in the last row. So just hold him so we can sit here. The very back row on the other side was taken up already. Me. I'm really sorry, but no. We need the extra space. I bought and paid for the extra seat. I'm not going to give it up just because you feel entitled to this space. Our things are already settled and stowed away. At this point, Entitled Mom is working herself up into a tizzy and has caught the attention of the older couple sitting across the aisle. The husband tries to tell this Entitled Mom to just choose somewhere else to sit, but she snapped at him to mind his own business. Kinda hard inside such a small place. So when she turned her attention back to me and my now fussing child because this strange lady is yelling at mommy, the wife waved down one of the flight attendants who came over. And that went along these lines. Flight attendant. Hello, are we all okay over here? No, this girl refuses to put her son in her lap to make room for us, even though he's clearly less than two and can fit in her lap. Flight attendant turning to me. Ma'am, is your child a lap infant? Me. He is less than two years old. See, I told you, make her move. But I did purchase him a ticket because I knew he would appreciate having some extra space to get out of my lap. I had grabbed both of our normal paying customer boarding passes and handed them to the flight attendant. See? Entitled mom. That doesn't prove anything. They give boarding passes for lap infants. Flight attendant turning back to entitled mom. Yes, they do give boarding passes for lap infants, but this is not a lap infant boarding pass. So I'm sorry, but she paid for that seat and there is no assigned seating, so you can't ask her to move. Entitled mom started going crazy, screaming at me and the flight attendant. Her kid is crying, but I think it may have been more out of embarrassment than that I or the flight attendant was telling them no. Anyways, the flight attendant ended up threatening to have her removed from the plane by air marshals if she didn't find a different seat. Entitled mom huffed angrily, promised to write a terrible review, and told the flight attendant specifically she was going to call opposite of Northeast Airlines corporate office and have her fired for treating entitled mom and her daughter so poorly. The daughter did get her window seat further up the plane. The flight attendant rolled her eyes where only I and the older couple could see and she apologized. The rest of the flight went smoothly. My kid laughed when the plane took off and then passed out in his seat with his head on my leg about 20 minutes into the flight and slept the whole time. And the flight attendant gave me a complimentary glass of wine once he was asleep. I told the pilots at the end of the flight how wonderful she is. I saw entitled mom inside the airport afterwards as we made our way to baggage, berating a cleaning staff member because the airport Burger King was closed at 11.30 p.m. as if the poor staff member had enough control over that to begin with. I pointed a TSA person towards them and went on my merry way to see my not-so-baby sister. This was about a year ago and I haven't thought about it really since until one of my coworkers said something that reminded me of it so I decided to share. Speaking of planes, do you enjoy going on flights or is it something you try to avoid as much as possible? Please let me know. Is there anything better than seeing an ex-boss fail a trial shift? Some years ago, I worked for a company that specialized in sushi and basic Japanese food. It was a good job, but a difficult one, made so by the fact all the chefs, managers, and most of the servers were pretty terrible at their job. But they had all known each other for years and kept making excuses to cover one another. Since I was the new guy, I had the hardest job of all, working the hot food section. Our restaurant worked like a regular sushi place. All the cold food and sushi went on a belt that traveled slowly around all the tables. Any hot food orders, and there were a lot of those, were sent to the kitchen. Me. I worked that section alone, even on days we were being slammed and I had so many orders the delay on food was up to an hour long. I was always alone. I was also expected to prepare all the sauces, clean the fryers, cook rice, and cover the KP when he went on break. I was always alone, even when we had eight other chefs in the kitchen, not one could be convinced to help me out. One would spend the day slicing up the fish, the rest would be prepping sushi or standing on their phones. Management did not give a hoot. What management did care about was my performance. Regardless of how hard I worked, it was never good enough and any customer complaints, regardless of context, were often excused as being my fault. The store manager, a red-headed boss girl type, 
would spend hours standing behind me being overcritical of everything I did. I worked 16-hour shifts from 6 a.m. till 9 p.m., often six days in a row. At 9 p.m., someone else would come in, take over from me. The restaurant closed an hour later and they got the reward beer they would give out at the end of busy shifts. I had worked at a fast food place previously, so I had been more willing just to put my head down and get on with a job in spite of the fact it was killing me. I finally did complain several times. No one cared. Finally, after two months, I became unwell and was diagnosed with muscle strain and fatigue. My doctor informed the restaurant I would have to work less, so they fired me. The red-headed boss girl manager dragged me into the office to explain that not only was I utterly hopeless at the three-person job I was doing by myself for 16 hours a day for minimum wage, but a customer had complained about finding a hair in her food which had been identified as being from my beard. Every other chef, except for one, had long hair and a beard, but it was identified from my beard specifically. It sounded like BS to me, but I didn't complain. They expected me to finish my 16-hour shift that day. Instead, I walked out. A few days later, I was hired by their rival company across the street, who paid me more, treated me with more respect, and I found a large number of other people who have also previously worked at that sushi place and had the same experience. Fast forward two years. Now, in Better Sushi Place, I am in charge of the ramen section. I've won several in-house awards for my cooking and am generally considered to be one of the best at what I do. Outside of a small incident involving a vegan menu event, I really love this job and had generally forgotten about previous sushi place until the day we started hiring new managers. We needed new floor managers. The company had made the classic error of promoting good servers to floor manager levels and it hasn't worked. We need someone with experience and a few have applied. Today is trial shift day for three of the promising applicants. The first one did very well, even noticed the few traps laid out by management to try and catch slackers. The second was nervous but did okay. But when the time for the third applicant comes, in walks red-headed boss girl from previous job. She greets everyone, scans along the kitchen line at all the other chefs, and then her eyes meet me. In my different colored hat, showing that I am at a sous chef level with the several awards I have won pinned into the side. I give her a smile and a wave. She deadpan stares at me for a lot longer than necessary before marching off to greet the manager. Her trial ends in failure. Not only is she slow and unable to direct the staff, barking confusing orders and getting overstressed at everything, she also cannot perform at a basic server level, cannot pour drinks and runs food like a clumsy first timer. It was a privilege and an honor to hear the other servers complain non-stop about her inability and general aggressive nature, remembering how difficult she had made things for me at my previous job and the BS she had made up to get me fired. Her trial ended early. She was politely thanked and we never saw her again. Manager came over to me after he heard I had previously worked under her and asked for an opinion. I gave him my honest one, told him of my time working at other sushi place and the fact I still have back problems from it. He nodded, trashed her resume, and that was that. Speaking of sushi, do you like sushi yourself? Please let me know. I want an apology from every employee. This happened a few days ago at my work, and it's a long story, but I will shorten it the best I can. This lady came in and was shopping in our shoe department. We just finished packing up some of our old season heels to make room for our new shipment. She found one that was misplaced and asked my supervisor for a certain size in the shoe. He let her know we just finished packing those styles up, but he will get her a worker to go through the boxes and see if she can find it for her. So two of my coworkers go to the wall we have our boxes stored at and start going through them. Keep in mind, we don't have to do this. Once it's packed, we can say, sorry, they are ready to send out. We can't open the boxes, but this day wasn't a busy day. So he decided to do it for this customer going above and beyond what is expected. My coworkers are going through the boxes and it took about 10 minutes to verify we did not have the size she was looking for. As one of them was gonna go find the lady, she was on the other side of a shoe display table with a mad look on her face, talking to my supervisor. Apparently, this lady went to him complaining that the girls were talking in the wall and took 25 minutes to look for the shoes and that it was horrible customer service. 
She then turns to my coworker and said, That jerk doesn't deserve a job. Where's your manager? And she replied, Well, you are talking to a supervisor. He's one. And she screams, No, I want his boss. And she storms to the front of the cast registers. My assistant manager was there, and so was I. This was where I started to witness this crazy lady. I was waiting on a customer when she comes up and slams the shoes down on the counter and says to my assistant manager, I want the manager. And my assistant manager says, I am the assistant manager. What seems to be the problem? And the lady screams, No, I want the manager. And she was told she is not here. And she demands her number and email. And my assistant manager tells her we can't give her that information, but she is welcome to leave her number and we can let her know to call her back. And that's when all heck broke loose. She went on a rant, lying about my coworkers talking in the wall and taking 30 minutes. Was 25, she claimed now it's 30, and that they need to be fired, etc. This went on for a few minutes. Eventually she left, but was apparently headcounting all the workers in the store as she was leaving. Later that day, my assistant manager contacts my manager about the situation and then contacts our district manager. My district manager takes it into her own hands and calls the lady to see if there's a calm solution. And the lady was nothing but rude to my district manager as well on the phone. She demanded an apology from every employee that was working that day. And my district manager laughed at her and said, that's not gonna happen. This lady was maybe 25 or so by the way. She was in no way a typical Karen, but this has to be the worst one I have personally witnessed. In the end, we were told if she comes back to call security and we do not have to help her. Bridezilla isn't satisfied with the free makeup I'm doing for her, makes me redo it four times. This was in 1989. Some of it has been forgotten over the years, but I recently asked my old friend about it, so for the most part, it's reasonably accurate. Long ago, when I was 19, I had someone I barely knew, my friend's cousin, who I'll call Brad, call me up and actually beg me, please, oh please, to do her and her six bridesmaids makeup because the makeup artist she had hired wasn't able to make it due to stomach flu. Found out she had quit because the bride had decided to give her half of what she had promised. Since I cared for my friend, she was really sweet. I reluctantly agreed as a favor to my friend. The wedding was in three days, and though I did theater makeup before, I didn't have nearly enough to do that many people and told her so. Brat told me to go buy more as a wedding gift. I didn't even like the jerk. I told her to either get it herself, give me money to get it, or get the others to bring their own makeup. She finally, with a lot of grumbling, gave me the money, enough to buy cheapish makeup, to buy more, so I did. Wedding day comes. I get to the church at 7.30 a.m. Wedding was Saturday at 11 a.m. Big bag full of makeup slung over my shoulder. I go up the aisle, through a door to the right of the altar, and to the back rooms where everyone was all there getting ready and everybody, minus the stylist, were all drinking at 7.30 a.m., especially the brad. Oh, lovely. The person doing hair was working on bride. The bridesmaids all had French twists with baby breath and two pounds of hairspray, so easy to do. So I started on the MOB and bridesmaids. It was easy to do bridesmaids and MOB's makeup, even if a few were rather tipsy and I finished all of them by 9 a.m. But brad's makeup, OMG. The entire time I did her makeup, Brad squirmed, kept turning her head, talking, gossiping, complaining, drinking, and demanded I use my best makeup on her. She had conveniently forgotten hers, go figure, while telling me exactly what she wanted. The styles had all but ran out of there the second she finished, all but leaving burn marks in the carpet in her exodus. I somehow managed to finish, and it looked very good, but Brad didn't think so. She took one look in the mirror and said loudly, It's all wrong. Do it again. So I did. I did it exactly as she demanded. Finished again, of course. It's all wrong. Do it again. Rinse and repeat, her becoming louder and ruder with each repetition. By the fourth redo, I was pretty fed up. I had just, yet again, finished the base, powder, shadow, mascara, and blush, and was working on the eyeliner on her second eye. When Brat, without warning, quickly turned her head to yell at M.O.B., causing the liner pencil to go across her nose and down part of her cheek. By this point, we only had 30 minutes before the wedding. Brat started screaming at me, 
telling me how stupid I was, how I sucked as a makeup artist, and she was glad I wasn't getting paid, peppered in with lots of nasty words, getting louder and nastier as she went, all while throwing stuff and having a two-year-old level temper tantrum, face red, angry tears making her remaining makeup look like a muddy river flowing down her face. I'd had enough, more than enough. I'd totally reached my saturation point. I turned to my friend, who was one of the bridesmaids, said, I'm out of here, then started packing up my stuff. Brad stopped yelling when she saw me packing. I think she was surprised into silence that I wasn't taking her crap, then resumed yelling, screeching more accurately. Where do you think you're going? You can't leave. I need my makeup done. I finished up, turned to her and said, tell that to someone who gives a crap, and walked out. I went out the door back into the main part of the church, her behind me shrieking things one shouldn't say in a church. Then I came face to face with a room full of wedding guests. They were just sitting there, all with a surprised Pikachu face, shocked beyond the ability to speak it seemed. Apparently that church had really good acoustics and they had heard everything Brad had said or screeched. I looked at all of them, shrugged, hefted my bag into a more comfy position and walked right down the aisle and out the double doors. I could still hear Brad shrieking like a deranged macaw as I left. I kept the extra makeup. Aftermath. Brad ended up having to let one of the other bridesmaids do her makeup. Too bad for her, that girl was not only, by this point, drunk, but also not good at doing makeup. My friend gave me one of the wedding photos a week later as a souvenir, and I nearly choked on my drink when I saw it. Brad, with neon blue shadow, bubblegum pink blush, heavy foundation in the wrong skin tone, and way too much liquid eyeliner, all with no blending on the neck, looked like Tammy Faye Baker after a two-week bender in Vegas, and Brad didn't even realize it. In the picture, the groom looked horrified and was leaning away from his new wife. It was hideous. It was glorious. I had that picture on my vanity mirror for two years. Sadly, a now ex-friend stole that pic and some other stuff for reasons unknown, and my friends told me that later on, Brat hunted down and destroyed every pic of her from that day she could get her hands on. I heard rumors some survived, but sadly never saw them. And the marriage didn't even last a year. The new husband later divorced her, then ran off with her younger, less jerky sister when he found out that Brat had been with the best man before and after the wedding. Last I heard of Brat, she had three kids, two divorces, works a dead-end job, and weighs 300 pounds. But that was a long time ago. I'm sure she's on her fourth divorce by now. You shut down my credit card. I work at a clothing store in a mall. Entitled customers don't frequent us, but unfortunately, that doesn't mean they never come. I had the displeasure of dealing with this wonderful lady a while back during the holidays. I do want to note, we do not have a store credit card. We've got the crazy lady. We've got our first manager and our second manager. I was in the front of the store when this lady walks in. Remember the cool mom from Mean Girls? That should give you an image of what she looked like, except she was on her phone. I welcome her in and she just stares daggers at me, then storms off to my coworker. I need to speak to a big manager, like a general manager or district manager, someone in charge. Manager one. Our general manager is on break, but uh, I'm an assistant manager. What can I help you with? Lady. Now you hesitated, which leads me to believe you're not a manager. No, I need your real manager. Manager 2 walks over. Yes ma'am, is there anything I can do for you? You shut down my credit card. Manager 2. I'm sorry, I'm not sure how we could have done that. Do you know what a fraudulent transaction is? Because when I inserted my card into your point of sale terminal, your point of sale machine read it as a fraudulent transaction and caused my credit card to be cancelled. Manager 2. I don't think that I know what a fraudulent transaction is. I have a degree in technology. Do you have a degree in technology? I didn't think so. That's probably why you work in retail. Manager. Can you settle down, please? I will not settle down. You shut down my credit card. While she yells at my manager, she's also on the phone with her bank. Her bank asks her to validate her information, which the lady replies with, I will not give you any of my information. That is mine and mine only, not yours. I get moved to the back of the store and miss the rest of Crazy Lady's tirade. Another customer told me that she claimed we embarrassed her in front of everyone in the store and that she exclaimed that she would be filing a formal complaint with corporate. 
I did hear her shout, I won't be here ever again, as she left, but she did come back when we allegedly sold her the wrong size. Entitled mother-in-law lived with us for six months rent-free. So, I have a lot of stories about this woman, but today I'm going to focus on the six months she lived with us. Little backstory, my husband and I got pregnant very early on in our relationship. I told him he wasn't allowed to propose while I was pregnant because I wanted to make sure he was marrying me, not just because of the baby. He ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me. We bought a house, had our son, then got engaged. My mother-in-law hasn't had a stable job since my husband was in middle school, lives off the government, has somehow assumed responsibility of several of her friend's kids plus her other grandchild. She has diabetes she doesn't manage which resulted in her losing most of her toes on her right foot. Three months before the wedding, mother-in-law, 10-year-old niece, and 3-year-old nephew, no actual relation, but we'll say nephew for simplicity, got kicked out of the house they were staying at and showed up at our door. We live in a three-bed, one-bath house, not very big. Still, we made it work until they found another place. I gave mother-in-law the spare room and put all three kids in a room together. Of course, at the same time she moved in with us, the government assistance she had been receiving was cut off. Long story for another day. So her only assistance financially to us were her food stamps and watching our son. I picked up a second job and my husband picked up extra hours. During her time with us, she treated my husband's car like it was a community car. Despite us telling her we don't want smoke in our house or cars, she was caught several times breaking those rules. My tip money would disappear from my purse. My nice camera disappeared. She would sell part of her food stamps and instead of doing anything productive, it would go towards cigarettes or weird random knickknacks she tried to display in our house. I said heck no, they were awful. As I said, this was before our wedding. She kept offering to throw me a bridal shower, which I declined knowing she couldn't afford it and I hate her friends. All I asked was she buy her own dress. Two weeks before the wedding, when no dress was bought, I used a gift card from my actual bridal shower and took her shopping. She hated everything, complained the shop was too expensive and ugly and wanted to go somewhere else. Again, I was using a gift card. The whole experience was awful. We finally settled on a floral dress she didn't hate. The day of the wedding, she only had to get herself and the nephew ready. We left her my husband's car, best man drove him. She was late to the wedding and delayed the whole service. We wanted to be able to get a hold of her since she had our son during the day, so we got her an older iPhone on our plan. She hated it and let the nephew destroy it. After six months, she finally left. We assumed responsibility of the niece. We still have contact with her, but it's much more limited and we are much stricter with favors for her. Anytime my husband asks if I still love him, I remind him if I was ever going to leave, it would have been during those hard months. My husband is an amazing, hardworking man and the best father I could ask for for my son. Would you ever let an entitled mother-in-law live with you? I know I sure wouldn't. You threw my receipt at me. I work at a craft store, which is usually a pretty chill job. You can typically count on crafters to have a little more patience than most people. I am usually a cashier, but that day they wanted me to run a demo, which I love to do. I'm in a great mood and chatting with the customers about the product we are demoing. I look up at the registers and notice a customer walk up. She is the only one in line behind the current customer at register. No biggie, right? Well, she seems agitated, like eye rolling, fidgeting, looking around for another cashier to come up. I am with a customer at the demo for a minute and finish up. In that one to two minutes, two other families line up. I rush to the register to help out with the line. I call her up to the check stand. Remember, she was waiting a maximum of three minutes. Customer, finally. Me, utterly confused because I know she hasn't been there that long. Huh? Pardon? It's about time. I shouldn't have to wait forever. Me, oh, in her eye roll. I'm sorry, did you find everything okay? Customer, with actual eye rolls. Yes. Me, okay, great. This woman isn't going to kill my good mood. Customer pays. Machine takes forever to process because life is funny like that. By then, customer is visibly fuming. 
Not my fault, but apparently is. Receipt prints. Me. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Customer starts dragging away calendar, and I try and put receipt on top so she can carry both. Receipt lands on countertop because she moved it too fast. Customer starts to walk away, turns around and screams. You threw my receipt at me. How dare you? Me. Wait, what? Genuinely, I am still baffled. You just threw my receipt at me. That was so rude. Yelling at the top of her lungs, drawing a crowd of customers who are all watching. Me. Looking around, absolutely confused as to why this woman is screaming at me for something I absolutely would never do. Um, I'm sorry? That definitely wasn't my intention. I would never mean to do something like that. Trying to smile and be friendly to alleviate the situation. You did too. I know you did. How dare you sit there and smile at me. I want to return this. Me. Okie dokie, can do. Anything to make this stop. The line is much longer at this point and the customers are staring at me. Customer continues to berate me with the same accusations for the entire return and is getting progressively more amped up as I continue to smile through my utter embarrassment and emotional distress as I am literally quivering from the stress. Thanks PTSD. Me. Finish the return. Thank you. Have a nice day. Customer. No. I want to speak to a manager. Me. Okay, can do. Call up manager. Customer continues yelling and making a scene, but I don't remember exactly what was said. Again, thank you PTSD. I look around at the customers gathered and they are all super uncomfortable. I look over at her family and they are looking everywhere but where their wife slash mother was making a scene. Manager arrives and introduces herself. Customer starts unloading on her and says basically everything that she already said, including a few minutes long tirade about how I am just standing there and smiling all smugly. Trust me when I say I was not smug. My manager listens to her for a while and just says, okay. She knows me well enough to know that is not my style. I have multiple customer raves every week in our surveys. Customer, is that all you have to say? Aren't you going to do something? What are you going to do? Manager looks at me. Would you like to head to the back? Me. Yes, thanks. I leave the situation, get back to the break room, and cry from the emotion and stress of a crazy person unleashing on me out of nowhere. After about five minutes, I have calmed down and cleaned my face up. I ask if I can go back to the demo, and I do. For the next hour, I had customers come up and apologize for her behavior and applaud me on how I handled the situation. If you saw a Karen treating a cashier like this, would you say something to them? Or just kind of brush it off? Please let me know. I deserve front row. You're nothing but a brat. As I'm writing this, I'm next to my girlfriend and she reminded me of this story. So strap in. This is going to be a wild ride. This happened at Bush Gardens, Tampa Bay. Oh boy, another Florida post. I'm enjoying my time with my father on vacation, riding rides, enjoying the entertainers. As some of you may know, Bush Gardens has something called a Platinum Pass that not only lets you stay on the ride for another go, it also gives you free fast passes. It's starting to close as we are in the line for the cheetah hunt and we are waiting in the fast pass lane. As we wait, let's meet the cast. We've got Entitled Mom, Entitled Kid, God Sent Savior Dad, we've got My Dad, Me, and the Bush Gardens employee. Entitled Mom waits in the regular line with perfect sight of us as employee walks over to us. She shows up later. Entitled Mom. Um, excuse me? Employee. Yes? Entitled Mom. Are you going to let us through? Just a sec. Why let them go first? We were waiting. As this continues, we get to go through first by another person and wait for the front row line. Employee. Sorry for the wait, ma'am. Finally! Now, when the ride is prior to 15 minutes closing, the front row line closes. We got lucky, but guess who didn't? Entitled Mom. Why did you close it? Employee. Ma'am, the park is 15 minutes from closing. It's the park policy. Then why did they get in? Because they were first? Now Entitled Mom is angry. Well, we were also first in the line as well. Are we being neglected service because this 80-year-old man... My dad is a crisp 68, and that got me mad. And his 50-year-old son should go before a single mother and her kid?
Before employee could speak, I went off. Me. First of all, Karen, we paid good money to actually get these passes so we could have a good time here. Second, the rule that the front line closes is plastered right there on the wall. Points to the poster on the wall. And third, leave her alone. She's just doing her job. At this point, I feel blacked out since my anger took over most of the time. But that seemed to shut her up at the time. Two minutes later, after waiting for our cart, it rolls up. Enter entitled Brad. Mommy, they're getting the front row. Stop. You'll let my kid on me. Don't care. We got here first. And please let this go so I can get on this ride. The cart comes back around and we show employee our platinum passes that let us ride again by skipping the line. Entitled Mom. Um, hello? Get off the ride. Employee. Ma'am, they have platinum passes that I don't care. They need to get off. By now, everyone else in the line is telling her that platinum passes let us ride again. As the cart gets ready to leave, I see the most stupid thing a person could do. Entitled Mom jumps onto the tracks in front of the cart. Get off the ride, you brat! Entitled Brat, crying, like, a lot. I wanna ride the cheetah, mommy! By this time, security has been called and is on the way. But for now, we have a devil to control. Dad, what the actual heck are you doing? Entitled Mom, right in my dad's face. Your brat is making up this pass! Even though clearly everyone here knows what a platinum pass is. Security, very calmly. Ma'am, get off the track now. I'm not getting off until my kid rides this ride. Front row. Security. Ma'am, the employee has told you many times that they were first. The line closes and yet you still think just because you're a single mother does not mean that you can bypass the rules. Entitled mom tries to unbuckle my seatbelt. Entitled mom is now screaming in my face as all the vests unlock on the ride. At this point, I've had it. And don't ask how I could muster up this much anger, but I did. Get off me! You have tried many times to break the clearly stated rules, and now you need to get the heck out. Get off me, and I hope to see you in heck. Now, I don't get angry a lot, but when I do, there's lots of screaming, and usually a fight breaks out. After I say that, Entitled Mom shoves me out of the cart and starts screaming about how I'm denying a poor kid a magical moment, even though he's still crying and that I'm a lying brat and whatnot. Why do you care? You don't work here, so you can't tell me what to do. Me. Sure I don't work here, but he does. All I can really remember after that is seeing her and her crying kid being forced out of the park. My dad is still shocked at what I said, since he hasn't seen me that angry. But hey, who cares? We all got something good out of this. My dad and I got more free fast passes, even though we have unlimited ones due to the platinum passes, Everyone was saved from the spawn that was entitled Mom, and I got the phone number of the cute employee, which was the Bush Gardens employee, and is now my girlfriend, that worked there. This was one heck of a repressed memory until she reminded me of it. I hope entitled Mom got the lesson of, don't mess with a quiet 15 year old and the staff of Bush Gardens. Hope you have a lovely day, and don't jump onto the rise track. Speaking of Bush Gardens, what is your favorite theme park? Mine's probably Disneyland. Please let me know. Entitled Mom tries to take my computer. I'm a big gamer. I play video games in all my spare time. I'm 14 and still have severe anxiety and have little siblings who are in a playgroup. I might have been a little rude in here, but anxiety makes me nervous in situations like this and I really hate people touching my stuff. So my siblings playgroup friends were coming to our house to play. They're all around 4 to 8 and since I'm not involved I don't know any of them. There were about a dozen little kids running around in our house so I just went to my room where I have my gaming stuff. Nice PC with a lot of color and big stuff which will be important later. Now for the cast. We've got me. We've got Entitled Mom. Some mom at our house who must have some connection with my mom. We've got Entitled Kid. Her 7 year old kid who wasn't that annoying but will be called Entitled Kid. And we've got my mom. Now I'm serious for gaming. I make a bit of money off of it so I can pay for college. My family's really supportive of it so they know how important it is to me that I get privacy. I'm very nerdy. I know, but I enjoy it. I go back so I can just get away from all those kids. One of them must have seen me, so he followed me back a bit later to see where I was. 
He walks into my room while I'm playing Call of Duty. He instantly went, Whoa, can I try it? Since he's like seven, I don't see why not. So I say, for like five minutes, sure. So I load up Minecraft, cause what else would he want to play? He's having fun doing whatever in creative and I'm watching him. After about 10 minutes, his mom comes in and says, Oh, there you are entitled kid. What are you doing? Playing Minecraft? Whose computer is that? Me. Mine. I'm letting him use it for a bit. He seemed interested. Oh, you should let him take it home. You're too old for silly games now. Me. Uh, no. I use it. It's my computer. Oh, what on earth could you use it for? I'm a nerdy gamer and it's what I do for fun. I don't like to tell people in person that I'm serious about it. I get in a lot of awkward arguments about it. Oh, you don't need it. Go outside. And she walks over and get this, unplugs it. Mommy, I was playing. You can play later. We can take it home. Me. Hey, that's my computer that I saved up my allowance for. Put it back. I told you, you don't need it. Grow up. We're taking it home. Yes, I do. Now get out of my room. At this point, my mom heard this and came in. Mom, what's going on? Me. This jerk unplugged my computer and thinks she's bringing it home with her. Entitled mom. Oh, for heaven's sake. He doesn't need it. He's a teenager. Entitled kid. Mommy, it is kind of his. Mom. Yeah, he paid for it. Now get out of his room. The entitled mom got out and I'm pretty sure she's not friends with my mom. I wasn't very worried about what she would have done with it. She wouldn't be able to carry it out, let alone all the wiring she'd have to go through to get it out. But still, very annoying. Why can't people respect other people's property? I would have let your kid play on it every time he came over, but I'm guessing she'll never be back. Customers continue to shop after I announce we're closed three times. I work at a large grocery chain in the US. We're undergoing massive renovations, so instead of being open 24-7, we now close at 11 p.m. For the protection of our overnight cashier, we don't leave until all customers have exited the store. My boyfriend and I were closing together after our manager left sick. We began announcements at 10.30 and then every five minutes starting at 10.40. We stopped entry at 10.55 and then focused on sweeping the store for stragglers. I made the first closed announcement at 10.59. At 11.01, my boyfriend calls up to tell me that there's two guys with huge carts headed to the checkout. I make a second announcement and then notice a group of three girls walking around the soda aisle. They ignore the announcement and continue shopping, so I page my boyfriend to that aisle and make a third closed announcement, which they yet again ignore. At this point, I walk over and politely tell them that the store is closed. They ignore me and continue shopping. Boyfriend, the store is closed. You need to start making your way to the checkout. Girl, we're almost done. We just need a few more things. Me, the store is closed. You cannot continue shopping. If you would like to come back and finish shopping at 6 a.m., I'd be happy to set your cart aside, but you have to go now. They try to walk down the aisle towards the back of the store, but I block them. At this point, I'm just fuming. Finally, they concede and begin walking towards the U-Scan. They were walking so slow. Then they stood at self-checkout and said they were waiting for their friend who ran back to grab some more stuff. Our overnight tells them that they need to start checking out now, and they do. Two girls keep running back and forth adding more stuff to the order. After they've done this three times, I tell them that they are done shopping. If they run back again, I will avoid the transaction and they can come back at 6am. Girl. Go home sis, stop telling us what to do. Me. None of us can go home until you leave. I don't care. Then one of the girls starts dancing while making eye contact with me and they're laughing. They were making comments about how I should just go home then. Then they ask to get a swisher sweet to which I respond, no, the store is closed. This whole time, the other two guys were profusely apologizing for being in the store and not knowing the hours. They were 100% fine because they were being extremely polite. Finally, everyone finishes checking out at the same time and we all leave at 11.20. By the time we scraped our windshields and drove home, it was 11.35. Entitled Mom tries to take my crutches at an airport. We've got me, Entitled Mom, Entitled Mom's husband, and Entitled Kid. 
This happened over the summer. Quick history on me. I'm a 14 year old male. I broke my leg a few weeks before this happened, so I was getting a bit better and was starting to not need my crutches, but not enough that I don't need to bring them with me wherever I go. My family and I were at the airport for our summer vacation to the beach. We had been sitting at the gate for about an hour and everyone was getting hungry. My family decided to get some food at a restaurant for us and had me stay back since it was busy and it was hard enough getting to the gate with crutches and so that I could protect our luggage. A couple minutes after they leave, Entitled Mom and her family come over and sit down in the chairs across from me. They had three very active kids who I'm guessing were triplets, maybe around five or six. I put in my earbuds and watched a movie on my phone so I wouldn't have to listen to them. I can see the mom getting frustrated with one of them. I can hear him say, but mommy, I want to. Typical little brat. Then the entitled mom walks over and gets my attention. I take out my earbuds a little annoyed already because what on earth could this lady want? Me. Yes? Could my kid try out your crutches? Excuse me? My kid really wants to try out your crutches to see what they're like. Could he? My crutches were sitting right next to me against the chair and the entitled kid was curiously looking at them. Me, kindly. Uh, no, I need them to walk. Well, you're not using them right now and he really wants to try them out. Me. No, he really shouldn't. They're not toys. I need them and I don't want him to break them. He'll be careful. He won't break them. Me, getting annoyed. I don't really want to take that chance. Could you please leave me alone? Now, I try to go back to my movie, hoping that the entitled mom gets the memo that no, her kid cannot use my crutches. Then the kid walks over, picks up my crutches and starts walking around using them. I might have overreacted a bit, but I have anxiety problems, so it's hard to control myself in a situation like this. I scream, hey, give those back. You're not using them. He's just curious. Me, it doesn't matter. Those are not toys. Now, with this kid being six, he wasn't even using them right, making the probability of him breaking them higher. I get up and limp over and take them from him before he does anything else. Hey, give those back to him. Me, now putting them on to walk back. No, they're mine and I need them. Can't you see that? Mommy, make him give them back. At this point, a lot of people were looking, wondering what was going on. The lady working at the gate desk, awesome worker, walked over. Awesome worker. What's the problem here? This boy won't let my son use his crutches. Well, he clearly needs them to walk and you have no right to take them. Entitled mom, now seeing a lot of people watching, huffs and goes back to her seat. I go back to my movie and everything was fine after that, other than her kids being very annoying on the flight. Now, I know that crutches probably can't break, but she still didn't have the right to let her kid use what's helping me walk. This wasn't all into detail, but since it was over the summer, I don't remember every detail. Thank you for reading. And to anyone asking about the entitled lady's husband, he looked like he didn't want any part of the entire situation. He kind of sat there the whole time, looking like he wanted to leave. Never tell a cashier what they can and can't do. So for some background, I work in a retail chain. Most of the time I work behind the till, mostly for 8 hours at a time. Now recently, the government has been cracking down on certain items being sold to people who are not old enough to buy them. In our store, it's a company policy to ask for ID on these items if they don't look old enough. We've got me, we've got the entitled parent. So to the entitlement. It was a regular day in the store. The tills were extremely busy and the store was making big bucks. It was around Christmas. So a customer had just finished paying and was leaving while I called for the next customer. This girl came up to my till with a few things and set them down on the conveyor belt. I began scanning her things and then I scanned the lighters. The way our system works is that when something is scanned that needs ID, the screen goes red and informs me that the customer needs to produce ID even gives you the date they should be born to be of age to buy the item. So I keep scanning the rest of her items, company policy, in case there's any more ID goods. I get to the end of her items and then the conversation begins. Me, excuse me ma'am, do you have any ID on you? Entitled parent, what do I need ID for? It's for the lighters. If you have ID with you, then I can check it on the system and you can purchase them. Well, I don't have any ID on me. Can you just let it go? I'm over 18. Context. This woman had so much makeup on 
that I really couldn't tell what age she was, but to me, she didn't seem old enough. Me. Sorry ma'am, I need to verify your age to make the purchase. By this stage, my tail had a big line and the whole situation was starting to become a big scene. This is where it starts to get interesting. I'm over 18. Let me take my lighters. No ID, no lighters. You've already scanned it though. You can't take something out that has already been scanned. Never tell a cashier what they can and can't do. I looked back at my computer. The woman at this point smirks, thinking she's one. I turn the computer around to face her, look her dead in the eye as I click the big red button that says no ID and the lighters disappear from the list. Her mouth drops and her face goes red. I then, in my best retail voice, ask, will you be paying cash or card? The woman explodes and shouts at me. One thing she said was, my son will not have any lighters now. I hope you're happy. With that, she left without all her items and her lighters. I told my manager after, and he said I was doing my job, so I'm not in the wrong. But this is not the end. On my next shift, I get called into the manager's office, and I'm told that this woman complained to the head office of the retail chain about me. Told them she was seriously offended and wants to get the police involved. Turns out, the woman was 20, so she could have bought the lighters if she had her ID. My manager tells me all of this smiling, but he still has the biggest bombshell to drop. After he received the phone call from head of office, they asked for the CCTV footage. My manager watched over the footage and heard everything, and I mean everything. Her last line before she left was of particular interest. It turned out that this woman did have a son, but her son was most certainly not 18. So to cut a long story short, this woman is under investigation and looking at jail time. For future reference, bring your ID everywhere you go. Crazy Karen takes our stuff and tries to sleep in our garden. Some backstory. My close family has been plagued by an annoying slash entitled Karen who was actually my father's grandmother. I never really liked my father's side of our extended family, except for his mother who was an angel and his grandfather and that's not relevant to the story. However, this poor excuse for a woman who we'll call Karen has crossed many lines over the last few years. Now, I wasn't the only one who didn't like her. Most of our family kind of hated her, mainly for the things she's done in the past one to two years. I'll get to that a bit later. Looking back at her behavior, I'd say she must have gone completely crazy at some point. Although I guess I can't really blame her because she apparently lost an apartment and a lot of money after she broke up with a man she fell in love with who somehow convinced her to give him a lot of her stuff and real estate. Now, the story I'm about to tell you happened in our big two-story family house in which I live, together with my two brothers, my mom, my dad, my grandfather, and my great-grandmother, Karen's sister, and also in our fairly large garden with a gazebo. This will be important later. Karen used to live in our country's capital city, and our house is located in a quaint town in the north of the country, about 120 kilometers from the capital city. Ever since she broke up with her boyfriend and lost basically everything, although it's kind of her fault, she's been acting strange and, as I said, I think she must have gone crazy. As far as I know, she became homeless soon after and started traveling between the capital city, our town, and other nearby towns. Begging, I suppose. I actually saw her begging in the city where I attended high school. So yes, I know for sure she's been begging even before our little story happened. Now, even before the main incident, there have been many minor incidents involving Karen. She used to stay at our house from time to time, even before she became homeless. And one day, my grandfather noticed there was a jacket missing. I don't know if it was expensive or not, but either way, the jacket disappeared just as Karen was leaving our house one day. I'm quite sure she eventually admitted she stole, so there's that. Other incidents involved asking her sister, who's in her 80s now, for money or stealing some from others in the house. Anyway, onto the story. As I said, there's a gazebo in our garden and one rainy afternoon, Karen decided to break into our garden and take a nap in it. To be fair, a bit of the fence was missing because we were making some adjustments to the garden, so it wasn't hard to get in. But that still doesn't mean you can just walk into our garden and spend the night there, right? Anyway, my brother and I were in our room, which overlooks the garden. Suddenly, my brother gestures to me to come over and have a look. There she was, Karen, in all her glory, getting comfy in our garden. I hardly ever take the initiative, as I'm quite introverted. 
but this time someone was invading my home turf. I guess my primal instinct somehow kicked in. Anyway, I put on my jacket and went outside. When I got to the gazebo, my grandfather was already there, shouting at Karen. There's not much dialogue and it might not be very accurate, but the main idea and the outcome are still the same. We've got me, we've got Karen, we've got Grandad, we've got police officers one and two. Grandad, if you don't get the heck out of here, I'll call the police. Now I remember Karen's voice as this screeching high-pitched noise ever since I was little. I haven't really seen this woman too many times, but I know she used to visit us when I was little. She was a normal human being at that point. Karen, go on, call them. This house is mine just as much as it's yours. I should clarify that this house apparently used to belong to Karen at some point, but we've bought it a long time ago. She didn't even own a single brick in this house when this happened. Granddad, that's BS. We bought it years ago. My grandfather then went and called the police while I was trying to calmly tell her to leave. Me, Karen, just leave. You can't stay here. Karen kept sitting in the gazebo, still getting comfy and shouting, calling us names. You get the point. A few minutes later, two policemen arrived at our house. Granddad, there she is, pointing at Karen. She's trespassing. This is private property. Karen to Granddad, is that how you repay me? After everything I've done for you? She didn't really do anything for my granddad or for our family in general, as far as I know. The two police officers were just standing there. I don't want to call them useless, so I hope they were at least listening to the story and watching the situation. Although, they did look quite uninterested in the whole ordeal. Karen. Ungrateful jerks. All of you. Is this how you treat an old helpless woman? Karen kept calling us names and it looked like she had no intentions of moving off our property. Officer 1. Ma'am, you have to leave. This is a private property, and if the others don't want you here, you can't stay here. But this is my house. I have the right to stay here. She kept shouting stuff like this ever since the police officers arrived. Officer 2. Ma'am, you have to leave. Come with us. They didn't handcuff her or anything, but I'm pretty sure my grandfather helped her leave by dragging her off the property. Either way, she left without the involvement of the police. Really, I guess the police officers were kind of useless after all. While she was roaming our street, she kept screaming and slandering us in front of our neighbors and nearby passers. After this incident, and actually before it also, Karen used to bang at our front door from time to time, demanding to see her sister, my senile great-grandmother, who kept on helping her despite what she's done to us and to herself. Karen kept on harassing us until a few months ago when we found out she had passed somewhere on the street. Edit. The story is missing a few details, but as some people in the comments suggested, there's only so much we could put up with. To some, our behavior may seem heartless, but it really isn't. Despite her being basically a stranger to us, we offered her more than enough help, but she basically just spat in our faces and refused professional help. If you had a great grandmother who acted like this, would you let her live with you? Please let me know. Karen doesn't want to share a table with me at a busy coffee shop. So yesterday, Sunday, I decided to get up early and go get myself organized. Me, 23-year-old female, and my partner, 26-year-old male, are in the middle of sorting out our flat and I needed to pick up some bits from Argos and the pet store for my cat. My partner was working. I live in a fairly large city in a retail park and stupidly didn't check the Sunday opening hours for the shops. So I got there at about 9.45 a.m. and most of the shops didn't open until 10.30 a.m. So I found a Costa and decided to have some breakfast and a drink until the shops actually opened. When I got there, the place was pretty dead and there was only me and two other people in there. The table layout was only in groups of four, so I sat myself down and just played on my phone for a bit. Turns out, there's a kid's workshop that goes on every Sunday nearby. So whilst I was sitting there, it got very busy very fast. Soon, there was nowhere to sit down. I'd nearly finished my drink, but it was still only 10.15 a.m. and it was still freezing. I didn't fancy standing outside until the shops opened. The queue was quite long at this point, with maybe 20 people or so in line. I noticed a lady, Karen, talking to her husband and looking at me. She was maybe 15th in line. They had a kid with them who was maybe 5 or 6. Karen made a beeline for my table with the kid in tow. Karen, excuse me? Do you mind moving so we can sit down? Me. You guys are more than welcome to sit with me, 
I'm just waiting for Arcos to open in 10 minutes and I'll be off then. Karen. No, you need to move. We want this table to ourselves. You're finished with your drink, so it's unfair of you to hog the table. Me. I'm leaving in literally 10 minutes. I don't want to wait outside in the freezing cold. You're more than welcome to share with me till then. By the time your husband's ordered and you've gotten your drinks, I'll have left anyways. Karen, raising her voice at me. No, you need to move now. I have a kid that needs to sit down, and you're being selfish. Her screeching had alerted one of the baristas who came over and asked if everything was okay. Karen, she has finished her drink and won't move, so we can sit down. Tell her she has to leave. I took a pointed sip of my coffee at this point to emphasize I wasn't actually done yet. Barista. Miss, she still is drinking her drink, and she is a paying customer as well. She has a right to sit here. Looks at me. Do you mind sharing your table? I went to say that I'd already offered, but Karen cut over me. I don't want to share the table with her. She needs to leave. Barista. This is a family establishment. I suggest you stop shouting and either share a table with someone or leave. Fine, I'll leave and tell everyone not to come here. She storms off, grabbing her husband. The barista rolls his eyes at me and went back to the counter. A minute later, a young mother came over and asked if her kid could sit down with me whilst she ordered drinks. I said yes. I spent five minutes playing with him and by the time the mother came back, I was packing up my bits to go and they got a nice table to themselves just by being nice. Don't mess with the only employee who can do the job. Backstory. About six years ago, I moved states, giving myself a fresh start. My sister took me in, for the story, I'll just call her sis, and offered me a job where she worked and got me in the door. Sis's exact words were, I helped you get in the door. It's your job to ensure you stay on this side of the doors. And I had no problem with that and made sure to learn as much as possible, doing it better than average. I eventually came to be placed in the same department as Sis. She wasn't a supervisor or lead, just a highly skilled and valued employee. The acting supervisor, Mr. Clean for the story, was great. He was tough, but fair, and as long as you did your job, he was like your best friend. Mr. Clean was very impressed by my work and work ethic, as well as my ability to learn and learn quickly so he and Sis decided to teach the most advanced and difficult job to learn. For context, this job was similar to Amazon. You picked, packed, and shipped to home for customers ordering online, e-commerce in short, and I had excelled at packing in Mr. Clean's department. He stepped me up to learn research, essentially making sure all picked products were present and packed, troubleshooting and finding missing products, and making sure all orders were packed when they should be, by computer tracking. And Sis trained me to her skill level. She had been doing it for three years already, and I even taught her a thing or two that I had picked up on. Everything was going great until six months into the job. Mr. Clean was being transferred to a new department, and we were awaiting our new supervisor, a guy from second shift picking department. Our lead had also transferred out. No major loss, he was all but useless anyway so we had no one to oversee the department. Sis stepped up and ran it beautifully, even better than Mr. Clean, and would report any issues she technically couldn't handle or address, like employees being insubordinate, etc. Until our new supervisor arrived. About four months later, he did. To merely summarize the fall of what was once a great company, our new supervisor, Brian for the sake of the story, was a jerk and proceeded to try firing many people, myself and my sister included, for the six months he was in charge. Brian was running the department into the ground, hiring only certain people and proceeding to stand around talking with them all day instead of doing their jobs before he was finally moved. This pattern of a new supervisor every six to eight months continued, with mixed results. Mr. Nice came next. Great guy, but couldn't bring himself to come down on anyone for not doing their job, and Mr. Clean coming back for a bit. Finally, we got our last supervisor, Waller for the story and he was a mixed bag, willing to come down on and get rid of the problem employees, but unwilling to really listen to anyone but Sis about department affairs and how to run it. This was acceptable until Sis unfortunately hurt herself so badly working so hard, she actually had to go on disability before she was 40. Now, it was only me left with any knowledge on how to run the department, head to toe. Waller wouldn't listen to me at all. At the time, I was under 30, and he felt since he was older and had been there longer, he knew everything, 
and it all went to heck in no time. Waller wanted everything done his way, despite the fact that not only would it not work, but it would make everyone's job 10 times harder. What would normally be a hard worked day, but ultimately satisfying day, became a day of sweat and physical pain of running around and fixing the mess ups he was causing. Waller would joke, you look tired, you shouldn't be working so hard. And finally, my give a darn was officially broken. Fine, I'm done working so hard. I honored old Waller's request and just let it roll the way he wanted. And it wasn't long before he came to me asking what was wrong and why it wasn't operating as smoothly as before. I reiterated that I had told him how it should be run multiple times already and that it was running smoothly despite his insistence to run it his way because I was fixing his mess. He wanted me to fix it and get it back to how it ran before. I said, are you going to run it properly or continue running it your way? Waller looked at me funny and said, no, I just want you to fix it. To which I replied, sorry, I shouldn't have to work that hard and handed him a vacation form for two weeks vacation. He was stunned, but had to sign off on it because of company rules. You can't deny a vacation request without solid and justified reasons. And for context, I was the only researcher left in the entire building. Nobody else knew how to do it. Waller technically knew how to, so he could do it and couldn't deny me my vacation time on that principle. Over the course of the two weeks, I was placing applications everywhere and taking interviews, finally accepting a job that paid better and was much closer to me. It took about a week and a half and I told them I'd start in two weeks. And here's the kicker. To get your entire vacation paid for, you only need to return for the following schedule shift to get paid, regardless of whether you quit. I returned that Friday following my vacation to, thank God you're here, it's been a nightmare getting this department to run properly. I just smiled and said, it's okay, I have faith in you. Waller gave me a perplexed look and proceeded to repeat my last workday's sentiment of taking it easy and letting the crap storm roll on through. At the end of the day, Waller came storming up to me demanding answers again. I simply looked at him and said, I quit, grabbed my check for the pay period and walked out. Waller was too stunned to say a word. Another two weeks went by. I had started my new job and was enjoying it. I had requested that Friday off for personal business and proceeded to grab my final paycheck from my last job. I made sure to get there when everybody was heading to lunch since the front room held our paychecks and the lunch room was next to it. I came strolling in as everyone was heading to the lunchroom, grabbed my final check and Waller saw me. He came running up out of breath and sweaty. He started complaining about how terrible it was running the department without me and begging me to come back. I was savoring the moment and had what I could only imagine was a Grinch grin on my face. He finally ran out of breath and stopped talking for a minute. I kind of just looked around, still grinning and finally looked at him, patted him on the shoulder and said, you look tired, you shouldn't be working so hard, before laughing and walking out the door. The company since then has never recovered, losing business and barely managing to get by. I heard through the grapevine that Waller was getting it so badly for his failures, he just quit in shame. I don't know what happened after that. What I can say is this, don't mess with the guy that practically runs your entire department for you and make sure you listen when they try to tell you how to run it or else you're the one who will be doing it and fail miserably. Because jobs are a dime a dozen and it's just as easy to find another job that's better, but it's not so easy to replace your top employee. I have priority because I have kids. I find it funny, this happened six to eight years ago and I still remember and laugh at it. Yes, the title is correct and this is a true story. It didn't happen to my family, we just witnessed it and were stuck behind the car of the entitled parent who did it. Cast, we've got me, we've got entitled parent, we've got nice policeman, we've got my dad, we've got the victim, and we've got the victim driver, the driver of the car that got hit. Okay, so we were on our way home from a family's day out and decided to pick up groceries from, let's call it Tosco. The place was kind of full and we were driving around looking for a space. The lady in front of us, here comes entitled parent, was driving around and saw a car with about three men in it parked in the family parking area, which was a place where parents with their kids were meant to park. Unlike disabled parking, it wasn't against the law to park there without kids. This is the UK by the way. But entitled parent didn't care. This was a family parking spot and grown men had taken it. She had three kids and needed somewhere to park. So this woman, 
this woman drove into their car. It wasn't like, I got you, sorry. She hit their car, but there was luckily no proper damage. Not regretting what she did, thinking she had all the reasons in the world, no remorse in the slightest, the woman marched out of her car to moan at the people she just ran into. The people were wondering who or what had hit them. Then this lady marched up to them and started yelling all the reasons why they shouldn't park there. Because she had priority and there were kids in her car. Then the guy tried to stop her and say that the kids wouldn't be alright if she left them there, but she moaned at him for that too. At this point, another person had seen what happened and, I didn't realize this at the time, went to get his store security guard. Entitled parent was busy yelling at the driver and was happy to see nice police officer so she could get him to help her in all her entitled BS. Officer, officer, these men took a parking spot meant for families. Arrest them. Nice officer. Ma'am, even though they shouldn't, there's no law against it, so they can park here. But I have kids and they stole this spot from me. Driver, this woman is crazy. She rammed into our car and then left hers to start rambling about how she has first priority. Because it's true. You shouldn't park there if you don't have kids. Officer. Ma'am, is it true that you hit these people's car? Entitled parent realizes he's an officer and gets slightly nervous. Of course not. They're liars. There's not even a scratch anywhere. Even though she hit them, it was just a bump, so there was no proof. My family, as nosy and just as we are, had seen and heard everything happening, decided my dad should go and tell the truth of what's been happening. Dad. Officer, is there a problem? Our family has been blocked by this woman's car after she hit this man and started yelling at him. Officer. So, you saw this happen? Yes. Entitled parent realizes she was rumbled, but there was no damage, so she would have been let off with most of her pride intact. But that's when the passenger decided to come in. Passenger. Officer, my neck hurts. Our car got jolted and I'm not feeling too good. Driver saw what passenger was trying to do and decided to exaggerate it a bit. Driver. Officer, see? If he's injured, we might end up pressing charges. Entitled parent was scared at this point and just kind of froze. Then she decided to hop in her car, which seemed like a good idea considering she had left her kids in there for about an hour. As soon as she was gone, everyone, including us in the car, had a good laugh at her expense. My dad actually chatted with the driver and the passenger and the officer before getting into the car and realizing we needed to get stuff from the store. How dare I mess up Karen's milkshake? Context. I live in a major city in my country, though out of the fray of tourist attractions. My boyfriend at the time, we were both around 15 when the story took place, we've been broken up for several years now, worked in a high-end touristy neighborhood for a large ice cream chain as pay tended to be better in this area. The people who frequent the shops there are either very wealthy or are tourists, though occasionally middle-class locals would venture in for a little fun. We had been dating for six months, apparently a very big deal to our freshman year of high school selves, so we decided to be a little fancy and go out in this area of town for a nice lunch and a walk down on the waterfront. We didn't dress up too crazy, but I was wearing a nicer outfit since it was a special occasion. He even gifted me a necklace and it was a really lovely afternoon. Well, it was a really lovely afternoon. We decided to stop into the ice cream shop where we worked to say hi to his coworker friend. Only one person was working despite it being a pretty busy area as it was a weekday. We chat with her for a bit. She was a woman in her mid-30s and she gives us each a free ice cream cone. It was nice and I was very dazzled by his work perks. We say goodbye and my boyfriend and I decide to shop around after finishing our ice cream admiring all the fancy clothes we would buy if we had the funds. We're trying on some goofy clothes and taking funny photos, typical high school fun, when he gets a phone call. It's his coworker, and she says we have to come back right away. He's trying to tell her he has the day off and we're out on a date, but she insists it's an emergency and we're the only people nearby. So we go back to the ice cream shop. It actually was an emergency. The freezer in the back that held all of their stock nearly $10,000 worth of ice cream in giant tubs, this place was a huge operation, had broken and the ice cream was beginning to melt. She had to go to the regional warehouse to get a company freezer van to salvage what they could as they were losing money by the second. The catch? She wanted us to work the store and business was starting to pick up. She found a company shirt for me to wear that was so big I was practically swimming in it and decided that even though I had no understanding of how anything worked, and had never even had a job before, 
it was perfectly okay for me to work the counter. And before you say, I was technically working there, I never got paid for the couple of hours I was working and really was not qualified to be representing the brand. The location later shut down. There were a lot of subpar business practices happening there that contributed. So with two 15 year olds in charge, the manager heads out and the people start to flow in. Again, I have zero training and my boyfriend is stuck on the register so I am scrambling trying to figure out which ice cream is which as behind the counter there are no flavor labels. I just try to tell people I'm new or just helping out for the day and most people are pretty cool and accepting of this and don't mind the couple of extra minutes it was taking for me to serve them. Keyword, most. Enter Karen. I later ended up working at a different luxury ice cream store later in my high school career and learned to spot the dreaded beast, but my sweet summer child naive baby self had no clue. She looked very typical of someone who was a native in our area, very businessy and clean cut, well put together with a permanent scowl painted across her lips. She came up to me and seemed nice at first. She complimented the song that was playing and even did a little dance. This put me at ease, she seemed so cool. She ordered her milkshake, the first non-ice cream cone order of the day. As she was the only customer in the store at the moment, my boyfriend walks me through how to make it. I don't know why he didn't just make it and spare me the wrath, but oh well. We don't bother explaining I'm new or anything, since we figure she'll put two and two together with how he's explaining to me how to make it. It takes me a while to make it and find everything as I didn't work there, but eventually I finished the milkshake and it actually looked pretty good. I give it to her and she gets really weird. She walks towards the register, sipping slowly. My boyfriend rings her up and Karen stops drinking it. I'm not paying for this. Boyfriend, I'm sorry? It's too thick. It's like she doesn't even know how to make a milkshake. Well, to be fair, I didn't. Boyfriend, I'm sorry ma'am, she is new and still learning. Well, she's incompetent and I'm not paying for this. I could see my boyfriend getting frustrated and I felt tears passing at the corner of his eye. He tells her she has already drank the beverage, so she has to pay. Begrudgingly, she obliges. She walks towards the door, hovers there, takes another sip, walks back to the register. This is ridiculous. I want a refund. Boyfriend, I'm sorry, I can't do that, but I can have her remake it. Hmm, <laughs> fine, but I don't want that girl making it. My boyfriend, annoyed, makes her a new milkshake, the exact same way I had made mine. She seemed pleased with the one he made and left us with no tip, just a snide comment as she walked out. You really should fire that girl, and I'm leaving you both a bad review. We watch her walk out the window, drinking from both milkshakes. We decided to close the shop at that point and wait for the manager. I then got my nice clothes, hair, skin covered in chocolate ice cream milk as we helped her load up the freezer van to take the ice cream to the warehouse. Speaking of ice cream, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Please let me know. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.